everybody, and welcome to Roundtable Live for April 19th, 2016. My name is Bear Taffy, joined by Mathis Games, Rockley Smile, Northern Lion. How's it going, everybody? Hello, Hello. everybody. So, Hello. so excited and ready to go. Apologize for missing last Friday's episode. Here's our sort of makeup slash preemptive makeup for uh, this impending episode that we're going to miss on Friday due to uh, 50% of the members of the podcast being at PAX East. But this is our PAX East show, and this is also our new layover show, or overlay show. That's the word for it. There's all kinds of fancy we, new art around, and these guys have no idea. Because we the, can never settle on anything for more than, like, six months. No, absolutely not. That's it's I good mean, to keep it fresh. The, I think new the brand point of this identity. show has been to try to confuse people as much as possible in order to keep them from listening. <laughs> Whether it be... <laughs> I'm keeping with that, I have a great announcement to make. Oh, good. <laughs> Northern Lion is no oh, more... Shit. Now we got, um, this is Southern Puma. Oh, shit. You gotta put Southern... the headphones over top of the hood. Yeah, he didn't, <laughs> get, the, he didn't get the look right. Southern Puma. Nice. Southern Puma says, go fuck yourself. What does Southern Puma <laughs> stand oh, for? Edgy. He doesn't stand Ed- for anything. Like <laughs> he just lays down on his back and gets ridden all day. That's pretty sweet. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I know, right? Jesus. It's awfully this is really hurting my name. really. It's actually like really hurting my ears. No, I get ridden by dudes all day, man. Oh, okay, cool, right on. Huh? That's nothing misogynistic minded. about it. Oh, that was my fault. That was my ignorance at play here. I love a good old deep cowboy dickin. <laughs> oh, the heck now. Oh, that is what you meant. I thought you were just gonna drive know, right? all over uh, the country. Like, is it sexual? Is it not? No, this is when what are we gonna get? To the podcast. Uh, when are we gonna get oh. Eastern Tiger? With. Uh, yes, that's me. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I've been looking for my, my dad. He hasn't taken his medicine recently. He calls himself Southern Puma. <laughs> have you, have you Western seen Western uh, Jaguar. Right. Yep. We, we want to thank uh, the uh, courtesy of Knight over on Twitter. I'm going to drop his link in the chat if you're watching us live over on twitch.tv slash roundtable podcast. Thank you very much, Knight, for the new graphics and overlays. Really appreciate it. It's all gorgeous, too. Really good work there. Uh, we got an awesome docket today lined up as well. Of course, we're going to be talking about PAX East 2016, along with GameStop's new publishing division, Game Trust, which is a really interesting story. Uh, more talk about games selling a whole bunch of copies, along with GTA Online making a huge payday off their microtransactions. Tons of games on the docket today as well. The Banner Saga 2, Dark Souls 3, Ratchet & Clank, more Enter the Gungeon, and... Uh, uh, well, no, we're not going to talk about that. Sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close that tab. Ignore me for a I'm- second here while I... Well, I, uh, We're going to talk of... about the New York primary. <laughs> <laughs> Live I mean, hell. Like, How did you yeah. know? I have all I these tabs open. As soon as we're done. Part mm-hmm. of the rebranding, we now cover politics. Yep. Did you go vote, Nick? Not yet. Uh, no. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we're going to talk about. <laughs> Nick. To start off with, PAX East 2016. It's happening. It's this weekend. Mathis and Nick, you're going to go. What are you excited for? Anything? Uh, <laughs> I'm excited no, to be in a physical geolocation where there are many indie developers specifically there. Very good. Um, to be very specific, and honestly, a lot of the stuff I want to see is mostly just talking to the people about uh, games I've already played. Uh, mm-hmm. I was looking through the mega booth here. There's not a ton of stuff that it's like it's new and mind blowing. I mean, like Dad by the Sword, I've wanted to play for a while, and I'm pretty excited to, to check that out. But, like, I want to go uh, say hi to a bunch of people that I've already played their game on streams and, and talk to tangentially through emails. That's, that's like, kind of the big thing for me. That's more to the point of what PAX is these days, right? Like, I think for the first couple of years I was going, I was trying to check out as many games as I could. I was trying to get that PAX experience. But now it's more of a boring networking thing. It's, a, it's an adult engagement. Yeah, yeah, this is the most adult one I think I've gone to so far. <laughs> Mathis, what are you excited to do? Are you gonna play games? Nah, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna be. I'm gonna see friends, basically. Um, I'm gonna be on the, the fucking Polaris, Polaris stage, booth. exactly. Yeah. Lemonade. <laughs> yeah. I'm like hey, super. Want to go get lunch? Uh, we only see each other once a year. Nah, there's some dope lemonade in the Polaris booth. Also, I you're got, not allowed back there. I'm gonna be on the the Polaris stage for most of the weekend. All right, if we're gonna start throwing shade for the unwillingness to corroborate with each other at Pax's. I'm I'm going to be a pretty large tree. You get it? This guy like, was tree like shade. Yeah? No? I get okay. it. Yeah. This guy's like, hey, let's hang out at PAX, and I'm like, you're not like in our hotel room right now, so <laughs> it makes it very difficult to to coordinate. You're talking, talking about me? No, I'm not talking, talking about, about you. You're I'm the one about about myself. 
You're the one falling asleep at 7.30 in the afternoon, basically. It's oh, true, man. On PAX Day 1. What Madness. was it? At, uh, at, where was it? With, I was with Dan, and I was just, like, asleep when he arrived. We just, no, he PAX just South, a, I think. Yeah, PAX South, and I just passed out on night Dan one. And he decided to Skype. skip you all a fucking picture. <laughs> oh, he <laughs> Skype does. On the bed. <laughs> Skype does, and he was like, it's 8 p.m. on the first day of PAX, and Mathis is on the phone with his dungeon master. Yeah. Oh, that was another night, yeah. I was missing my D and E session. What the so. fuck is this world we live in? <laughs> <laughs> I was missing my D and D session. They wanted to know what my character would have been up to while he was away. So oh no, of course they you did. You went on a business trip and you had to Skype about your D and D. He packed out this business that you don't understand. The worst out. part of that is that he prioritized that like far ahead of ever hanging out with any of us. Like, God forbid you take a night packed out to go take some. No, not even that. I'm talking about fucking Pax Prime. 2015. The so the order's like sleeping, and then D and D, and then the Polaris booth. Yeah, that's like that's then how it goes. Then more naps, food maybe. <laughs> naps, then more naps. Calls his wife. I nap a lot. I pass at, out constantly. At E3, he's gonna he's oh gonna have God. no choice. <laughs> at E3, he's us. just gonna be fucking strapped to a dolly, and we're gonna have to wheel him around while he's taking like naps Kate. midway Kate between. Is like, Kate is like, after PAX Prime, you're going to come to Tokyo Game Show with us? I'm like, that's 10 days after PAX Prime. You want me to take a 17-hour flight after a 7-hour flight 10 days later? You're insane. 7-hour well, uh, flight. You're going to go to GDS, like... but you're not going to come to PAX East? <laughs> come on. What? I'm at PAX East. I live right there. No, I was talking to Ryan. Oh. I'm not, I'm, how many TGSs have I been to? Freaking zero. How many PAX East have I been to? Too freaking many. <laughs> Too freaking I, many. Like, I'm, holding out on, I'm holding out on PAX East this year. Uh, out out of principle because I mean we we don't have to get into this but it's just like it's expensive to go to PAX East and then it's also still like in the basically the country I live in it's in the continent I live in I'm like man if I'm gonna spend that much money and then just you talk shit I might as well just go do something else you heard it here first from Northern Lion folks the United States is basically Canada what it is more will we learn. Canada. No, it's not yeah, that it exotic is. to fly from uh, from Vancouver to Boston in the winter time. At, at that, well, it's beautiful, balmy Hawaii weather outside. I'm gonna go fly to Boston and become a freaking uh, popsicle. It's, it's gonna be quite warm, right actually. Uh, it was 70 yesterday, so it's, it's actually not bad. Spring right now. weather right now. You can yeah. have your windows open, t-shirts, light jackets. Maybe it's perfect. Well, the problem with last year's PAX East was in the beginning of March for some reason, yeah. so it was just like freaking ice cold. It's a huge difference, yeah. temperature-wise, the, the one month. I hope they took that into account. I feel like that might have been a deliberate change. Otherwise, I was going to make a point yeah. about this maybe being the year that we finally realize climate change is happening to us all because it's like <laughs> 40 degrees warmer <laughs> over the they course do it of like, the year. It's based on when they booked it. Like, I guess there's some other convention that comes through sometimes and has the convention center booked in April or in March, so they have to alternate mm -hmm. it from time to time. The Marsh ones are the worst, yeah. though. Yeah, that was Second some of the coldest of I've ever been. Everybody just wanted to stand outside for, like, five hours and do nothing when we were waiting <laughs> to go to the next places. <laughs> it was, like, fucking freezing. Yeah, it was bad. Uh, well, as far as actual games uh, being showcased at PAX East 2016 this year, we tend to look at the mega booth as we are typically indie-focused. We tend to keep our uh, attention there for the most part. I'm looking through the list here right now, looking at a few that we've seen before. A lot of these are ones that we've seen already in previous lineups, like uh, Kingdom, for example, a game that I uh, continue to sing the praises of because it's one that I thought was one of the best indie games, uh, if not one of the best games of last year, I guess it will be now. Jeez, 2015 was last year now. That's weird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a novel concept, right? <laughs> I guess. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to hate on you for that. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, Kingdom's on there as well as Moon Hunters. I think I've seen a couple of times. Moonshot and Moon Hunters. I might be getting confused for one another now that I think about it. Uh, looking at the list, anything on there you guys in particular are interested in seeing? Nothing. I, Nothing. I don't. I don't know what's going to be there. To be it's honest, it's mostly yeah. a lot of stuff I've already seen, yeah. but also a lot of stuff that like I already played too. Mm -hmm. So it's just sort of like like I said, it's like a meet and greet situation. Uh, the funny thing, though, is unlike most years, there's not a lot of ones that have just been, like, reoccurring perpetually forever. Right. Those seem to be mostly gone now. It's like, you know, the Shovel Knight type of thing where, like, every pack it's the same game. And it's still good. It's just, like, it's not out yet. I guess Speedrunners would be, like, the closest to that. I'm sure Tiny Speed Bill Speedrunners finally speed came out of Early Access yesterday, yeah. didn't it? Or uh, was it yeah. today, even? <laughs> 
I think it was today, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 18, Enter right? the Gungeon was that for me. Like, it was just at every PAX, and it was like, this is ready to be played, but they're like, no, not yet. We're not ready. Yeah. The list has well, certainly dwindled. Supergiant is showing pack or showing Pyre, which they just announced. The same okay. studio that made... Um, I, why am I trying to call it Bastila? Bastion and uh, Transistor. And I think that looks cool. And Night in the Woods is going to be there. It is uh, an artistic kind of narrative adventure platformer, which looks cool. And Tumblestone is going to be there. I hear that is a sweet, uh, puzzly, competitive multiplayer game. I think it's... I mean, I don't know about you guys. I'm not trying to shit on any developers. But when I go to PAX East and you walk through the mega booth and you're like, oh, there's like, you know, Plants vs. Zombies 2. And there's... Um, you know, I, I'm trying to think of what has been there, like, forever. 17 different puzzle platformers. Right, of course. And <laughs> I'm, I'm just like, man, like, I'm the more stuff that is at the Mega Booth that is not out is better, I think. For me mm. personally, because, I mean, uh, I, I recognize what Nick is saying, that it's like a networking opportunity. For But for me, I prefer to, like, keep all of my correspondence to email whenever possible, because it means that I don't have to shower. But to actually be there and be playing games I, that, that I haven't played before, I think, is really cool. And um, th- that's, that's what I like about the PAX experience. But I, I won't be there this year to, to say yes or no to that. Mm-hmm. You know, there's Night in the Woods and there's also Through the Woods. Yes. And I wonder, I wonder if they're trying to steal a little market share there, maybe. Just, just a little bit. Isn't, maybe. well, I mean, font-wise, they do look a little similar. But Through they, the Woods I, it's is a like joke. That's... I don't believe they're really doing that. Through the Woods is that horror yeah. Red Riding Hood game, or maybe not Red Riding yeah. Hood. Yeah, mm. I liked the idea of it. I played the demo like last year, I think, at this point, and it was pretty short. I liked what they were going for, but it was it needed a lot of work at the time. Mm. I'm looking so. at uh, myself, looking at Block Hood, actually. That was a game I've had my eye on for a little while there. I actually have that in my Steam library as well. I think I tried it out for a while. It's that uh, minimalistic sort of city simulator you're you're more or less building like a giant tower of small accessible blocks it reminds me of well mm-hmm. i i played a game way back in the day called ute tower that was on my uh i think i played that on a mac actually ute tower ute, ute, ute tower. tower yeah like how you would Y-U-T-E? say ute yeah like how you'd say youths in the south or like in my cousin Vinny. <laughs> right yes ute tower that was a good one U Tower was most of my uh, middle school gaming experience, actually. Although I never actually got past, like, a two-star tower. I'd always get to the point where I got to that two-star tower, and then I... It was probably a failure as simple as, like, you should put bathrooms places so people can pee. But I didn't yeah. understand that with my young, feeble mind. I couldn't really do puzzles well. I still can't, actually. It's not, a, not really a skill I've really developed up into adulthood. Block it, though, certainly yeah. looks good. It looks guys, really cool, actually. Did you see Astroneer? I was just looking into that. That looks pretty sweet. You, like, explore Astroneer? different planets and then, like, blow up parts of them with deformable terrain and try and get resources out of them. Mm-hmm. It's like a third-person thing with kind of, like, really muted, pretty graphics. I'll probably go check oh, it out. Oh, yeah. I I think I got an email about this game. It looks familiar. Astroneer. The alpha footage. I... And of course, below from Cappy Games. Oh, yeah, I'm below. sure everybody wants to play that quite a bit. Making a few more appearances. Astroneer, I like this uh, terraforming they're starting to show us in the trailer as well. Here it looks pretty interesting. Uh, there's been a there's been a theme, I think, in increasing frequency of lost in space games. Like uh, the Solus Project is a particularly yeah. standout mm. example recently that you were talking about, Nick. I like that though. I'm a sucker for that. I think it's just such an easy theme to get into. The idea of that lost in space, which is becoming more prevalent too now that we're actually going to space, which is so cool. It's yeah, I'm so ready. Easy, it's so easy to engender that feeling of wonder when you're in a planet you don't even understand, yeah. like mm. what could happen next or or how they're going to take it in terms of story development. So, you know, the outer space things just really fit into that theme well. Indeed. I think survival games benefit pretty well from moving it beyond just being in a forest or zombies and going into that kind of unknown. Uh, one game I've, I've picked up recently again is Subnautica, and Subnautica does that mm-hmm. incredibly well, which I love that game. It's really good. Well, there we go, I think, uh, for PAX East 2016. Not a ton that we uh, really have on our radar <clears> this year. I think it's maybe uh, the, the lineup. I don't want to say the words the lineup is weaker this year because that just implies 
uh, that the games themselves are weaker. But uh, it is important to note, poignant to note, I think, that uh, we are not nearly as excited this year as we was we were on last year's as show. We was. As, as we, we was. As we was last worry, year. <laughs> I worry, though, that that's like a byproduct of not recognizing the games, which doesn't necessarily mean that they're not as good. But, like, you know, the last couple of packs have had stuff that has been kind of like Kickstarter darlings or stuff that has yeah. been on the indie radar forever, like mm. Hyperlight Drifter and Titan Souls, Enter the Gungeon. You know, even stuff like Below has been there forever, obviously. Transistor was still doing the rounds this time last year, yeah. um, even though it had come out recently. So, I don't know. I, I kind of like that there's less stuff that I recognize, even though I'm not going to be there. I think that it is... Uh, I mean, it's it's nice, I guess, that a lot of this stuff is new and you know, there there is a few entries on the list that have been there basically for a, a long, long time. But I like that it's fresher and you're not necessarily just seeing the same, you know, faces over and over. Is it not just a smaller lineup in general? Because it just seems like a smaller list in totality. I don't know, like 78 games in the, the Mega and Mini booth is like, it's a lot of games. Mm -hmm. I guess. I'm just looking at the floor plan and it feels like there just aren't as many, like, channels to walk down. I think oh. the point that Ryan makes is interesting. I think we had that wave of, as you mentioned, Kickstarter darlings that sort of spiked a lot of new interest in these smaller devs and the indie devs in that scene. And we don't really have that platform that is like that new and young platform that is bringing a whole bunch of new eyes to things. And so now it's sort of just getting, or it's gotten back to the point of a lot of people use Kickstarter, a lot of people use Indiegogo. It's no longer like it's no longer a novelty to have a Kickstarter up anymore. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like a few years ago that was actually yeah. the case where if you had a Kickstarter going and it was it had a few eyes on it, that was sort of unique. You were kind yeah. of gaining traction where other people weren't really able to do so. So now that we don't really have that, I guess there's not a ton of different ways for people to get eyes on their games apart from, you know, of course, what this is is supposed to be that, right? The Indie Mega Booth is supposed to be a giant place where a bunch of people can come see your game. But yeah. unfortunately for people like us who try to look at this stuff ahead of time and get a good idea of what it is we're actually excited about for seeing there, then, you know, it is, it's starting to maybe become a little bit too cluttered for us. In general, I still, like, I mean, it was a couple of years ago, but I like what I did for PAX in 2014 where I was like, hey, you're going to be in the Mega Booth instead of, like, subjecting us both to having to shout at each other it would be awesome if you just emailed me the demo build for your game and then i could look at it at home but yeah. even even still like it, it's a surprisingly tough sell and part of that is because people are like working on it like the morning of the show opening yeah. up so i can sympathize with that but you know the mega booth is still it, it's still excellent i still like spending my time yeah. there and um, I think they do a little bit better every year at, at making sure that shit is open. Like, the people don't just, like, gawk around with backpacks on and clog it up so people yeah. are stuck in there for, like, six hours trying <laughs> oh, to God. push their way out. Like, it's, I think it's, they've been doing a better job organizationally. And, Come uh, Sunday, you makes want to murder those people? Better. Yeah, well, yeah. You, you hope that by Sunday most of those people are gone, but then it turns out they all have the same plan as you, where they're like, let's <laughs> wait until Sunday, and then nobody's going to be in line. I'm like, looking at actually... Oh, go, yeah, ahead. go ahead. No, no, please, please. Go All ahead. right. I feel like the mega booth is at its best when, like, instead of being like, I want to see this, you're just like, okay, I have like four hours. I'm just gonna like meander and basically check out everything that I can check out that looks interesting. And and that's it's kind of the the thing that I've been trying to get out of it for uh, the last couple of packs that I've been to at least. And it's nice um, when it, when it's organized, you can actually do that, and and there's a little bit more space. And um, I, hopefully, it's like that this year. Not that I care. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking through the list right now, and there's actually a lot of games that I feel like we've all at least looked at and played before too. Uh, even stuff I that, saying. um, yeah. One, I'm surprised it's not even out. Is Star Crawlers? I'm actually thought yeah, that was going to be out soon, and I didn't realize been, that it wasn't. That's been in the works for a long time. Yeah, I will go see sometimes always monsters though. Because always, sometimes monsters was great. Is another one that's been there probably a couple years now at least. Maybe a they, year, yeah. They're like, you know there's two of them. There's always sometimes and sometimes always. Always sometimes monsters was the one that was out already. Oh, you know, no, I yes. did not know this that. Is the, oh, okay. This yeah. is the sequel, sometimes always nah, monsters. See, which... that, 
I don't know about that now. <laughs> it sort of seems <laughs> like it's confusing branding, doesn't it? Oh, I, yeah, it's definitely I kind a of agree. super confusing name, and I disagree with the way they named it. Mm -hmm. But I really liked uh, Always Sometimes Monsters, so I'll go check that out. I remember the demo for Sometimes uh, Always Sometimes Monsters, the first one, uh, was like this kind of self. <laughs> I'm just going to say the first it. one and this one. <laughs> the, the first one for PAX East or whenever it came out was like kind of like the self contained demo, so I'm kind of hoping they have the same thing for the new one. Um, I'm waiting so for the bad. third game, yeah, <laughs> which monsters. Is always, well, I was thinking always sometimes monsters you, which yeah, yeah it would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> monsters the always Wii U, yeah. for the Wii U, right? Yeah. All right. Well, no, for the PS4. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. It's just to further alienate audiences. What are you talking about? I got nothing on my mind. <laughs> Pax East 2015. It's or 2016. See that that year thing? It's tripping me out, man. I can't believe it. Okay, We're man. advancing into the future. I mean, uh, it is almost halfway through the year. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. We are we are six weeks away from halfway through the year. We were honestly talking about it. This year in particular, it feels like PAX East just snuck up on me out of the blue. It wasn't even on my radar until April, and now it's here. It's just insane. The progression of time. Wow. Talk about an interesting topic. Yeah. Huh, <laughs> I know, right? If you're not planning on going, that stuff just sneaks right by you. I mean, once yeah. the like end of August pops up and it's like there's like 50 cons in a row, I'm like, uh, all right, just block it all out. We're all yeah. just really All of my friends are dead for two months. I'll see them again someday. <laughs> Mathis is going to, he's going to Emerald Con? City and uh, Bay Con. Mathis and is going, going to Bahamas. Bacon. Jamaica Con. Yeah, he's going to so go to. So many cons. I bet. You know, the the next three weeks for flying, I'm gonna hate myself. So no, I bet you're gonna have a good time, man. I bet this I will is when gonna... I'm there. I mm -hmm. absolutely will have a good time once I'm there. I just have a stupid fear of flying. Yeah, you just well. basically this is your time to get over it because it, it, you're it, gonna it, be exposed. <laughs> crash course. Oh, I shouldn't call it a crash course though. So don't call it a crash exposed course. Exposed to it always. <laughs> yeah, it'll be fun. I'm yeah. excited. I'm honestly excited to go to E3 just because it's been something I've wanted to do since I was a kid. Yeah, Even but now it's not that thing anymore that you wanted to go to when you were a kid. When That's when was that ruined for you? Because I know it was. At what press point? Press wank fest. Yeah, exactly. At what point did E3, E3 become a press wank fest? It's always been a press wank fest. Yeah. <laughs> in your mind, though, it's different in your head. Like, there was a I'm point... still excited to go, man. I'm still, I've got That's a little good. bit of that a childhood excitement. Because E3 is just why, like, watching, like, uh, G4 TV covering E3 when I was, like, a teenager and stuff. Just being excited to go. I don't care if it's like all business suits and a complete wank fest. Just to be able to go and enjoy, just be like, hey, I've been wanting to do this forever, and I finally get to. And I'm, I feel I like finally get to applaud really banal <laughs> it's, announcements it's not the about their quarterly earnings. Congratulations! It's not the suits that I'm uh, <laughs> that I'm concerned about or even bothered by. It's going to be like, hey, is that Ashanti, like 2001's uh, hip hop princess? Yeah, yeah. Why, why does the Shanti get ushered into the back room to play that game? I've been dedicating, I've been dedicating my short adult life to trying to get influence here. And uh, Shanti, she hasn't made a song since like 2006. <laughs> You're gonna send her <laughs> back there to check out. Better person than you. She deserves it. You're gonna send her back there to play the new Homefront game. Is that Dan Giesling, the winner of Big Brother season 10? Why is he getting <laughs> back there when we've been working well, it's on very this? Very clear why he's getting back there. I don't know if that's really yeah. the same comparison. Uh. Wouldn't that be like the best part? This is tangential in its entirety. That'd be the, that's got to be like the best part of being a celebrity is that you gain that clout for things that you have absolutely no expertise in whatsoever, but you still you still get that access. Yeah, I, I, I want, can confirm it is. I want to see there being like this this lineup of like all the press people lined up, and then you've got like the people who are experts and like say it's like a Dark Souls thing, and the whole Dark Souls community is there, and then they just pull Dan Giesling and bring him in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Do it in front of all of them too, just to make yeah. them see, make them watch. Oh, all right. Pax East 2016 and the E3 Wank Fest that follows. That was our topic for a little while. Let's get. Can't help but notice uh, everybody's really happy about Pax. Nobody's got any uh, optimism for E3 whatsoever. I'm excited. What's up with for that, E3, man? I'm he did say E3. he did say he was excited for I'm, E3. Man, this well, he's implicit because he's coming. I'm just. I'm oh, yeah, surprised at the cynicism surrounding uh, surrounding E3. I I, I still want to go. It's still in my like top five experiences as a as an avid gamer. 
I, I, I get to apply that label to myself, right? Do I deserve it yet? I'm hosting a show about video games. That means I'm a gamer. You probably qualify. Okay, yeah. cool, yeah. Puts you in the top 50%. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I think, though, it was probably about a year into doing this stuff. Like, not into doing it, like, full-time, but into doing just videos and being intrinsically involved with gaming. Uh that I realize that E3 is not what I made it up to be, and what I see of E3 is, for the most part, what E3 is, right? Like, the convention experience, walking around from booth to booth, we know what that's all about, but as far as what I wanted to go and see at E3, I don't think there's much more beyond what we are witnessing, you know, like on the live streams and the coverage that yeah. we are presented, basically. I'm just excited that it might be a convention that has air conditioning. Maybe. Like, it's the Staples Center. I'm really hoping it has air conditioning. Well, I hope so. It's going to be in L.A. in the middle of June. <clears throat> I'm yeah, it's better to have man. air conditioning. Pretty much everywhere, it's going to be hot. It's getting yeah. My reasoning about why E3 was more exciting back in the day was because when we were kids, we didn't have access to live streams of it, first of all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So, like, there wasn't all this information coming out aside from, like, the usual pundits that would show up and make a big fuss. So, like, we didn't have any other outlet or way to see around the whole thing other than just, like, whatever showed up in magazines. We wish we were in the middle of it. Yeah. Um, and now we've got the experience of knowing what it's like to be at a con of varieties and sizes. And it's like, it's just another one of those, only there's no real meat to it. You just stand in front of a stage and wait for it to be over. Yeah. I'm going to save a bunch no. of money and just... <laughs> no? <laughs> how, how I mean, that's that what the... That's what the press conferences are. But then there's the press conferences, and then there's a con. Like, I don't. Yeah. We might not even be invited to the press the conferences. conferences. Yeah. And to be honest with you, I'm I'm completely happy to just be out on the floor instead of doing that. But uh, no, I, like it, I'm not really interested in the experience of uh, of watching like Phil Spencer tell me what the next big thing on Xbox One is going to be. But I, just walking around there, I think, is going to be fun, and it's a different con experience. Yep. See, that when is I was not in Boston in April. Like, <laughs> like when I was younger, I think I, I like created this fantasy that when you're in the games press and you have the inside scoop, that they're bringing you into the back room where they have all the actual cool, awesome games that they're not showing the public. Right. right? Yeah. Like that's the point of E3 <laughs> is to have these backdoor secret meetings where they show Halo off the actual six. good stuff. Right. Yeah. <laughs> But now, no, I think I'm just, I'm disillusioned to the point where I'm happy to, instead of uh, spending the money on the flight and hotel, I'd rather just, you know, like, pay the 15 bucks for the VIP VR experience now that we're going to get, where we just throw on our gear and headset and watch from the seat that's reserved in the E3 booths. Under a mushroom. Right. <laughs> that's the most <laughs> I will say, exciting part. Matt, Matt, this is the one who has to justify it, because we live close enough to LA that we could, uh, we could walk. We, we started, like, right now, but... I, I guess I'm still like a kid in that regard where like I still get excited about conventions and walking around the floor and playing games and E3, I, I understand what it is, like I logically know what it is, but just the, the experience of going is something I still want. Yeah. And I just want, I, I don't know, I can't get fully cyn like cynical about it all. I, I, I still enjoy that I, aspect I, of it. Yeah, you wait until after you get back and that's when you can start to be I don't know, man. I mean, it. we do have to wait until we're there to judge it. But I think, as shitty as this might sound, the fact that it's not necessarily a consumer-focused convention might be to the benefit of us as press, in the sense that it'll probably just be a lot easier to get around. Yeah. And, and I mean, at least instead of being like, hey, who's this dude with the huge-ass, like, army backpack that's blocking the way? It'll be like, oh, it's Ja Rule! <laughs> it's Ja Rule! It's amazing. <laughs> uh, it is... I mean, I didn't really want to go to EA or to, to E3 because it's in LA. But I was like, ah, eh, we should do it once. And then if we like it, it's easy enough. And if we don't want to go you again, then you'd be like, I did it. Yeah, you, go. you seem and to you be on... like they, apparently E3 only employs artists, musical artists that haven't put out any music since like the early 2000s. I I mean, it's possible that I might be most excited about seeing Exhibit and. 
Cisco and perhaps like the lead singer of Hooba Stank, like whatever oh, no. <laughs> exhibit announcing Pimp My Ride 2 for the Xbox One. I was yeah. so in. That far off though. There is this really weird love affair that the games industry has with like washed up music celebrities. Yeah. They just bring them in and give them the VIP treatment every time. It's their resurgence. It's this is how they reconnect to the younger audiences, man. That's how you got people it. who don't give a shit about this stuff get all access to everything, and the people who do care don't get to come in. Yeah. That's just that's just media in general. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we are all implicit in that on a day to day basis whenever we email someone asking for a free code. So I, I, I don't want to bite the hand that feeds on that one. Yeah. I'm mostly I'll just be- projecting about all this, though, because I'm bitter that they haven't invited me to E3 yet. <laughs> it's really going to be great. You can go to uh, Emerald can- City Comic Con, it's right so. next door. Yeah. It's basically the same. It was I like a week and a half. I don't want to go to LA. <laughs> it sounds no, like you an don't want to go to LA. No. I also do not want to go to L.A. I like L.A. But have you been to L.A.? Yeah, I've been to L.A. What's L.A. like? It's just, you Hookers know. Hookers and blow? Okay, I well, haven't been to L.A. Now. enough to it's really like even have like 7 million like... people live there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's not all hookers and blow, probably. Like, I haven't even I been there be enough to have a very solid opinion of it. But, it's, you know, it's just like it's L.A. And I'm sure living there is probably completely different, too. But from when I was there, it's, it's very nice. It's warm. It's hospitable. And... They, they, well, okay, there were giant mosquitoes that latched me down and tried to suck my blood from my <laughs> neck, but I thought that was just, you know, part of the lax experience, you know, they're welcoming me to the, welcoming me to the state. Only in New York. Mm-hmm. Slash Cali. Slash Cali. It's a coastal <laughs> that's what, thing. That's what they say. <laughs> that's, that's, you're always like, hey, I'm walking here in New York and California. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to the, let's get to the juicy story here. GameStop launches their full publishing division. It's called Game Trust. Yeah. It's our new topic. They have, uh, ahead of uh, even really getting started here, they've actually announced four signings as well uh, with Ready at Dawn, Insomniac, Frozen Bite, and Tequila Works. Probably from that list, I imagine most people are familiar with Insomniac, uh, in- incredibly so now because they just released the new Ratchet & Clank game along with the new Ratchet & Clank movie coming out this month. Uh, you may have heard of Tequila Works from their game Deadlight that came out on the Xbox Live Arcade. I believe Deadlight that was, was good. Deadlight was pretty good. Yeah, I enjoyed Deadlight. It's on Steam too. Nice. There you go. And uh, right. Ready at Dawn like- apparently is the uh, developer be- behind the Order 1886, and then Frozen Bite is Trine. So pretty good uh, developer lineup there to start off with for Game Trust. How do you guys feel about GameStop as a as a publisher though? Because I know that Ryan and Mathis definitely have some. Uh, some opinions about this. I just I want to I want to hear the the gist of it at first. What's your what's your general takeaway from hearing this news, Nick? Uh, well, I should disclose that GameStop have paid me. Yes. <laughs> in the past, as a manager for their corporation, uh, an assistant manager. Uh, so my takeaway is that it's actually the best thing they could be doing right now because they need to get with the times or go out of business. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's not a lot of other options for them other than to be a little bit more dynamic and look at the bigger scope of what video games are about other than trying to sell freaking game advantage cards and, and fucking GPGs, uh, game guarantees on the discs that they soon won't be carrying. Um, so the fact that they can see the writing on the wall and that this is not a sustainable business model for them is a really good mark in their favor. Um, so, yeah, it's probably the best thing they could do. Mm-hmm. Mathis, how do you feel about it? I feel pretty much exactly how Nick feels. I think this is, like Nick said, they, it's only a matter of time before they would go out of business if they didn't push forward. And as long as it's a publisher, they just, you know, don't really meddle too much with the with the developers. Let the developers do their thing. They can make good money doing this. And I think they're exclusively, like, staying in, like, the B-tier games. Like, they're not doing, like, big AAA things. They're doing, mm-hmm. like, uh, with Insomniac there. What was the name of the game? I apologize. We uh, talked about Song it of the, the Deep, yeah. Song of the Deep. That mm-hmm. kind of style of game. Um, it'll probably be very he- heavily digitally distributed. Uh, I think it's smart for them. They're probably going to make a good chunk of money. And as long as the games are good and good quality, I have no reason to be mad. I do, however, think it's funny that they named it Game Trust. Yeah. Because it's fucking GameStop. <laughs> Right. And That's... Just, I think it's yeah. just funny. I mean, like, just working there and knowing all about how they, they work their numbers a- aspect and the way they make a profit off of their used stuff. I think Game They're Trust all about is trust, great. right? It's, it's a, a little hilarious. 1984-ish, right? Like, that they would bit. name it that? Like, they're, they're just putting it out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll really see how it goes. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, sorry. I worked at GameStop too, everybody. Yeah, yeah a long time. Ago. Do we need to disclose but, that? I don't know if we actually. No, need not at all. I, I did it at been to a GameStop. <laughs> yeah, I've been to a GameStop once. one time. I used um, to hold an Edge card, an Electronics Boutique Edge card. So I'm not sure if my opinion out. can be taken at face value. It might be a little tainted. Might be a little tainted. I was getting 10% off as a result of being in their exclusive program. Uh, used games only, of course. Used games. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. These are you the doors that well. open when you're a B-list YouTube celebrity. This is the <laughs> set of perks I was talking about. It'll 10, 10% off your used game purchase, sir. Mm. <laughs> Ryan, and it only you... costs you uh, $3 a year to hold the card or $3 a month. I can't remember. It was... It's been a while. Do you have do you have strong feelings about game trust, Ryan? No, I would have strong feelings if anybody was like, "This is super shitty." But because nobody appears to be like that, I'm totally I can be cool like with that it. If you want, like for the for the interest of making the show interesting, how about that? Why is it I mean, shitty there? Well, <laughs> publishing games, you got to give them a chance to like at least come out with something and be like, "This sort of sucks," and then wait for the development studio to be like, "Actually, they meddled all the time," and then yeah. we can be like, "Oh, it's the evil empire." But for right now, like. <laughs> The studios that they've signed up for this are pretty impressive, like Insomniac in particular, but in Ready at Dawn, it was like a year ago they had a, a game that could have been huge, and Trine, I know that the Frozen Bite guys have fallen on somewhat hard times with the release of Trine 3, but they still have a pedigree behind them, and you know, I'm not the biggest fan of Deadlight, but sure, Tequila Works is, is a known developer. Um, I think that it's, it's good news, and sure, I mean, I don't really care about GameStop from a business perspective. But they probably do need to reinvent if they're if they're going to survive when physical sales deteriorate even further. They're probably not going to sell like a hundred million dollars in four double A indie games or triple I indie games. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean it's a start. It's a diversification that, that seems to make sense. Is that the verbiage like, we're going with now? The triple I format. I kind of like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that yeah, works. Thing. Tri triple I indies. Yeah. You know, it, when I left, it was 2010, which seems like such a long time ago, and they were like aggressively pursuing uh, expansion in like Europe and things like that, and they were just like basically shutting everybody down to uh, just put stores up everywhere. Yeah. And I felt like they were going so hard on it that not only like there was the two things they were putting a ton of money investments into expansion, and also we were just about peeking over the curve of when used game uh, market was probably going to start going away because of digital distribution. Right. And I, I really didn't follow it all that well beyond after I left. But I just I have to believe that, like, they've got to be pretty well down that curve now. So for them to not make an adjustment would just be suicide at this point. So it's, I mean, good on them if they are actually adapting. They seem like a company that didn't really embrace change the way that they wanted us to embrace change as employees. So I guess they figured it out. It's like Blockbuster not kind of going the way that, you know, um, what's the name of that? Netflix? Not I Netflix. I hope it's not Netflix. Redbox. <laughs> oh, Redbox, yeah. Redbox kind of like ate into Blockbuster. And I guess Redbox offered uh, to be bought out by Blockbuster, but they're like, no, we don't need you, I whatever. Think it was so Netflix, they did their own actually, thing. that Blockbuster was, was going to buy. Yeah. Some, yeah. Some, I know Blockbuster turned down something that ultimately kind of fucked them, and now they're just kind of gone. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad to see, you know, GameStop kind of. See the way the world is going and make adjustments. Yeah, I think the uh, the announcement is good. I think the lineup is really solid. I think that's what gives me a lot of confidence about them. Not that I necessarily need to give them a vote of, or a vote of confidence or anything, but I think that's what makes me think this is going to be a, a pretty solid entry into the publishing world. And we're actually sort of in a position right now where we could kind of use another big publisher. You know, like. We're starting to lose a few big names. Lionhead fell to the wayside a few months ago. So honestly, like more competition could be pretty nice. They have a very interesting advantage as well. I mean, it seems pretty obvious, but with the fact they have like what probably a few thousand brick and mortar stores around the world, like those are all giant advertising hubs. For GameStop and they're yeah. free pre-order at GameStop exclusive free DLC. Yeah, well, okay, you thought that was a joke before. We wait until Game Trust is actually in control from top to bottom <laughs> of what you're getting there. That is. I a... was at Best Buy like a week ago, and it was like if you buy Dark Souls Three, you get a free metal case. That's like, yeah. not a lunchbox. That's like it, yeah, <laughs> like a case that the game goes in. Like you just <laughs> that's the wrapper. Yeah. Like you get what is this? this is like we'll it will give you a free bag to take it home in. Mm -hmm. I don't understand we'll like give you a, a proof of purchase receipt along with your yeah. purchase. 
this swag market is so out of hand with what people think are collectibles now. They'll just give you anything and say it's special, and all of a sudden it's special and people want it. But I don't know if they really want it. They just take it because it's on offer. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like a self-reinforcing cycle of stupid. It's the same with those yeah, snowball shit, dude, memes, they got man. The steel book. Like What's the that? Dark Souls 3 Steelbook, I could sell it for fuck all in 10 years on eBay mm. for like three yeah. hours of my time and a couple of stamps. I can't wait until 10 years from now when fuck all is like a valid form of currency. That's what I'm going to pay for everything in. It will be if insert rival candidate here wins the primaries today. <laughs> Mo- Nick, I have to say, if candidate inserted here loses because of one vote and you're not out there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Documented yeah. evidence of you not voting in the primaries. <laughs> it's a welcome to Mooseport situation. I I wouldn't want to be you, man. We're gonna be reading I the uh, the CNN headlines tomorrow. Candidate A would have won if local man hadn't been busy hosting low end video yeah. game <laughs> podcast. <laughs> the voter turnout was ninety nine point nine 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 percent. The entirety of New York City turns out to vote. In the primary elections. Man, I wouldn't want to be me either. Yeah. I don't want to be me right now. Oh, just thinking about it. Of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be you right now. Can uh, I just leave? To go vote, if that's what you're suggesting. That's the only no, I'll just leave. absence ballot. <laughs> With Game Trust, though, I, the uh, yeah, as I mentioned, like the the fact that they have all of those just massive advertising outlets at their disposal has got to be something that's probably going to be a pretty big allure for a lot of these smaller companies. And this is interesting too because it comes at a time where people like Devolver are beginning to you know sort of try to push the discourse that you don't necessarily need a publisher as an indie, like. Indie developers, especially of this size, I think Insomniac is sort of like a, an anomaly in this group of four. I don't know if I'm alone in considering that, but, you know, like, these, these developers, they have got to be looking at this as just, like, a massive opportunity just because of the, mm. the, the clout that GameStop brings. And knowing GameStop, though, and the way they love to leverage everything, though, it worries me a little bit how much they're going to take advantage of the developers in that situation. Mm-hmm. They're very aggressive in a lot of ways, and they'll be happy to not disclose a lot of shit, and nobody will find out. Can I just say, like, my least favorite part of this is that logo? Like, It sort of you... looks like a swastika a little bit the first time okay, I see it, but now I, I don't see I it. I wasn't going that far, <laughs> but, like, to me, I get it. It's like a G and a T stylized, yeah, but, but the it's... way it's stylized to look like a like a kanji character or something like that, yeah. it's like... <laughs> Those video games. Oh, it looks like <laughs> Daikatana's logo. Yeah, it really I want, does I want look like Daikatana's logo. I that shit padded on their back, like in five years, without realizing what it is. Look at the sweet I mean, symbol I got on my back. I'm just waiting for somebody to show up in chat and be like, "Actually, in Mandarin, that means like oh, yeah. diary." <laughs> <laughs> means bleak outlook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If you take a picture of it with your QR code reader, it just shows you a picture of Bobby Kotick's asshole. Oh, God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. What the... <laughs> he doesn't work for GameStop, but no, they just wanted yeah. to mess with I haven't heard about Bobby Kotick in a while. Nope. I'm glad like to... Full meat and just, it shows dick butt with it. That's it. <laughs> glad we could work Bobby Kotick's asshole into this story, man. I, it was... It was a long time. Nobody's got to work it's that my, thing. Yeah, man. Card against humanity card. <laughs> <laughs> but if it's really going to be a cards against humanity card, it has to have like one more adjective, like Bobby Codex blank asshole. Yeah, puckered or mm, really anything. You know, sore crusted or something like that. <laughs> Fuck me. <laughs> what is going a on? Can we biscuits, move on? A this mixed is... box of biscuits. <laughs> Dark Souls 3 has already sold 500 million copies, according to... 100 million. Oh, fuck, yeah, sorry. (laughs) I thought you were just being hyperbolic. Dark Souls 3 has sold 500 (laughs) billion copies. 500,000 copies for Dark Souls 3 over on Steam Spy. Doing quite well. How have you guys been enjoying Dark Souls 3? Really loving it so far. Uh, Nick's beating it. Ryan, have you... You haven't beaten it, right? No, right, I'm like I'm right. still in the first probably like quarter of the game. Have you beaten the first uh, Lord of Cinder? Uh, as long as we're throwing out spoilers here, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is an opening cutscene that that is your job to kill uh, Lord of Cinder. 
I, I don't want to say because I don't want to. I don't want to tell people. Well, I don't want to spoil. Like I don't want to know where we're gonna go. Store like conversation wise, but. Let's start with the, the, the general gist. So let, me, let me give you guys a launching point here, I guess. So as someone who played through the entirety of Dark Souls 1, loved it. I had, I had my Bedouin guides, as I mentioned before, that were able to help me through a lot of it. I uh, got to Dark Souls 2, and I more or less decided that it really wasn't for me. Uh, well, let me, let me see how many hours I actually logged into Dark Souls 2, if I can p pull this up real fast. It was uh, 10. Oh, wow. Okay, so that is a little bit more than I thought it was. Yeah, it's due I, diligence, for yeah, sure. I gave, I gave it the good old college try and then decided that ultimately the, 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 you know, the appeal was not there for me. So is Dark Souls 3 then maybe something that might bring me back? As someone who, uh, like, let me tell you, I guess, like what actually drove me away, I guess. Uh, I think it was maybe a little too intimidating. To get into it in multiple ways, actually intimidating, just based on the difficulty level, obviously. But then you've got uh, just the sheer amount of lore and uh, exposition that is contained within this game. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they expand on that in Dark Souls Three as well. But you know, it's it's sort of it's sort of just a, a tough one to sink your teeth into. And I'm wondering if this is the the game that's gonna maybe make me want to get back into it. Well, for those reasons you cited, I would say probably not. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just as hard as it's ever been, yeah. in my opinion, and the lore really is hard. perhaps even more pronounced in this game than any of the prior ones. Um, I mean, I would say you should definitely give it a try and see if the uh, the feel of it clicks for you. I mean, it certainly performs very well. It looks absolutely beautiful. It is a uh, beautiful game. Mm -hmm. But it might be prohibitively difficult again for you at certain points, and that is it's part of the experience at this point. It's not really any getting around it. It's just going to be a hard game. So you've got to be a bit of a masochist to appreciate it. Are there parts of Dark Souls 3 that are different from Dark Souls 1 that may be more appealing now? Uh, how do you mean? It's yeah. the what same exact formula, really. More or less, yeah. That's, that's sort of yeah. the question I'm asking, I think. The only thing I can think of that's even mildly, I guess, different from Dark Souls 1 is that it plays a little faster. Mm -hmm. It's not much faster, but the combat smudge is faster. a little bit... Sm smudge <laughs> not too faster. Not too smudge. Uh... But it definitely is a, a bit more of a quicker combat pace. It's it's not like Bloodborne where it's like aggression all the time. It's still, you know, be cautious, walk into an area, like look around, have your shield up if you use a shield. But the combat does feel a lot a faster paced than Dark Souls 1 and 2 does. Other than that, it's still very much Dark Souls when the way you play. Yeah. How have you felt about it, Ryan? I think it's really good, but uh, I've got to play a lot more. It's going to take me forever to get through it. Like, um... Me too. I'm I'm basically doing like half an hour a day, so half an hour to two hours per day. So it's probably going to take me like at least a month to get through it, and it, it's going to take even longer than that to kind of distill how I feel about it. But it definitely seems like if you're a fan of the series, there's pretty much no reason not to pick it up. I know people have very strong uh, feelings about Dark Souls 2. I still think Dark Souls 2 fits exactly the criteria of what I said, where if you like Dark Souls 1, it's worth playing and, and worth playing through to completion, but uh, Dark Souls 3 seems more faithful to the original. I would say that's true. Fair enough. With Dark Souls 3, uh... Oh, no, hold on. I lost that. There, there it goes. Ah, here we go. Yes, the, uh, the sales data for Dark Souls 3 up above 500,000 now. Uh, another game that, okay, this is maybe where that 500 million figure got into my head, and I, it probably is now that I look at it. Uh, quick note on GTA 5's microtransaction report. Coming in at 500 million bucks. GTA Online has uh, reportedly generated over half a billion dollars <clears throat> in microtransaction revenue. And uh, from the article, the article here, to put that into context, Halo 5 made about $1.5 million in microtransactions. And Halo 5's microtransaction system, I do want to note as well, is actually uh, one that I didn't really mind oh, at all. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. Somebody mentioned the H word. Come to the defense <laughs> of Halo again. I, I, I'm even sort of defending microtransactions now these days, which is a position I didn't ever think I'd be in. But... With Halo, it was uh, it was just like this little rec requisition system uh, that you could spend points on, and it, I thought it was really well. I, okay, there's two parts to this with Halo's system. A, I thought it was pretty non-intrusive, and it was the sort of microtransactions that I could be okay with, but uh, also you know just sort of felt like they didn't add any real value to the game and weren't at all necessary. 
but also sort of played into the uh, the new gameplay system and the the ranking system that Halo Five had. Uh, but with GTA Online, of course, you're looking at you know a whole bunch of different reasons, different justifications for purchases. Uh, and it's working pretty well, and that's the other part of this too, is that Halo 5's, while it was non-intrusive and not really necessary to uh, buy into it, it, it sort of translated into a lot less sales for their microtransaction department. 1.5 million as compared to, obviously, you know, GTA Online is going to be uh, kind of the, the, the bar that has been set for earnings potential, but, you know, that, that comparison still, those are both pretty blockbuster titles, and... That's a that's a huge disparity. Yeah, but like I feel like GTA Five or GTA Online might have like three hundred and fifty times more active players. Also true to begin with. Like <laughs> for every five hundred players of Grand Theft Auto Five, how many Halo Five players are there right now? Yeah, maybe point. probably more than one point five is is my <laughs> guess, but. <laughs> Uh, but still, like, yeah, I mean, it's it's making a lot of money. I think mm. Nick has something to say. And... Uh, you know, a game that doesn't have any any DLC announced for it is Dark Souls Three. <laughs> <laughs> we just like, blew by it. <laughs> uh, we just did the weirdest fucking transition over to GTA, no, and we, we were, uh, it's targeting... fair. You know what? I had I had a, an idea in mind of trying to group <laughs> together all these different large amounts of money and numbers, but it's sort of. It sort of got skewed, but we will go back to Dark Souls 3, and in fact, do you want to do that right now? I will open I, up the door for that to happen. Dude, it's, it's your show. I just didn't know what the hell happened. No, I was it's very not! Confused for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> not anymore. Uh, yeah, that, I, I mostly just wanted to make note of the fact that GTA 5 Online has made half a billion dollars. I mean, it probably just insane. reinforces the fact for, that we all know that microtransactions are going anywhere anytime soon. Yes. Exactly. They make too much exactly. money. They may only be getting larger. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, you know what exactly. makes a lot of money? The international arms trade. <laughs> oh, oh shit. shit! Sell them per bullet. You know, but who not if insert candidate uh, here <laughs> wins the primary I knew today. It. I knew it. Uh, Nick, go vote, Nick. Lincoln no, I... Chaffee <laughs> for United States Ombudsman mm -hmm. 2019. Rocky De La Fuente. Own? The Budman? Um, ombudsman. The Ombudsman. I've never heard that word before. No, uh, he wouldn't. Mr. Not Involved in the Political Process <laughs> at all. Ombudsman. How do you spell that? O-M-B-U-D-S-M-A-N. It is the entity of an institution yeah. in charge of ethical concerns and complaints. An official appointed to investigate individuals' complaints against maladministration, especially that of public authorities. Huh. T-I-L. Oh. Yeah, I, I told you're going to tell me you don't know what a comptroller is. No, that I've heard of. Ombudsman, I never heard of before. I never even heard a single time. Not once. Mo many of today's top public officials uh, began as ombudsmen. They call them ombuds boys <laughs> when they first get started, though. They have to apprentice for four years first. Oh, my huh. God. All right. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to rein this back in, if at all possible. Let's do go back to Dark Souls 3, though, because I, I, I think, Nick, I want to give you the, uh, the pedestal again. Well, I, I don't necessarily need to just lead the conversation. I just wanted to keep getting into it a bit because I felt like we hardly scratched the surface here. Oh, yeah, here. absolutely. So we, there, we've, we've gone over the differences. We've gone over the, uh, the approachability. The graphics, gorgeous. Stunning looking game. Another in a, in a long list of games this year that have just looked absolutely fantastic, too, which has been really nice. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's much uh, dissension in the idea that this might be the best looking Dark Souls game. I think probably yeah. everyone would agree with that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. It, it looks very similar in the, the level of detail and polish that Bloodborne did, uh, only, of course, more set in the Dark Souls universe. There are actually quite a few similarities between Bloodborne and Dark Souls 3. I do believe that in some ways the level design and the structure of it uh, sort of feels a little bit similar. Um, I, I was a little hasty in jumping in when I at first was tweeting a little about Dark Souls 3 in that, well, first I said, oh, don't worry, it's, it's as uh, open as Dark Souls 1 is, and then I got a little further, and then it felt a bit more linear, and then it opens up a little bit more, and then it gets a little bit more linear again. So it sort of rides the line a little bit between both of those two concepts, and I wouldn't say that any other of the Souls games or, or Soulsborne games get really quite as interconnected as Dark Souls 1 ever does. Yeah. Uh, but this is probably about the next best thing. 
Um, it, it's not distracting or it's not like a bad thing or anything, but I personally really love that about Dark Souls 1. That is probably one of my favorite things about it, just how interconnected the world is. Um, but this has little hubs that link together in their own right and not so much back to the beginning. Uh, for the most part, the place you start at the beginning never really has you come back to it in a meaningful way. Uh, there's some stuff that kind of goes around it, but there's not really like a whole world around the main hub, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And I think I have this like really strange, like perverse attraction to like Metroidvania in the element where you start a place and then you get keys or abilities that allow you to further explore yeah, the place yeah. you started. So like I find that in any game and I just I love it so much. And when it doesn't have that quite to the degree I want, I guess it sort of like pushed me off a little bit. Um, but all, all things considered, I did finish the game. It took me about 40 hours. I would say it's a good game. Uh, there's very little that I have like an objective complaint about, although I know quite a few people did have a lot of crashes, and I did notice a memory leak issue with it, which I guess those are about the closest you can get to objective complaints. I didn't personally have the crashes, though, uh, and I'm sure they're working on addressing that. But uh, for the most part, the game runs pretty well. I mean, they even made some really good improvements to the online. And the fact I was that just going to ask do... you that. Yeah, so the multiplayer yeah. works pretty well in this iteration then, right? You can do passworded rooms now, so you can actually play with just certain people if you want, mm -hmm. uh, which is really nice, and we're actually using that to play it on the NLSS, which I quite appreciate. Um, I mean, coming from where we started with Dark Souls 1 being like a really bad PC port, mm -hmm. and then Dark Souls 2 being like sort of stilted and broken for a while, and then like updated, and it was just a confusing PC port. This is the closest I think we've gotten to like a proper PC release, and also that it came out in parallel with the yeah. console version is a pretty momentous thing for Dark Souls as well. It is so. funny that we say that this is the closest we've come to a proper PC release from them, given the fact that we just spent a lot of the past couple of episodes just hurling shade at them for their terrible release schedule. Like, their actual release yeah. of the game as opposed to, you know, the <laughs> port. But, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, they've gone through a lot of shit. It's been, like, mm -hmm. it first started with a, a freaking survey. Uh, do people want to buy this thing? And they were not going to make it at first, and then they did. Yeah. <laughs> So, like, this is where we've come. Now we're actually to the point where we're actually developing for PC properly. Uh, that's why I say it's the closest we've gotten. I mean, yeah. it still could be better, but it works, and it came out on time, and mm -hmm. you can buy it. <laughs> so that's it's good. It's all we ask for. Sometimes, usually. Sometimes, usually, monsters. That's the next <laughs> That's what I need. That's the that's, third one. That's also a great tagline for Dark Souls 3. Sometimes, usually, a monster. Sometimes, usually, monsters. <laughs> <laughs> try, try tongue, butthole. <laughs> I'm enjoying it a lot. I think I'm enjoying it more than maybe I enjoyed the first two, even though I really did enjoy Dark Souls. Because the first one, I'm playing with the idea of, like, lore in mind. Like, I played the first two without really paying attention to the world or the story. And then I learned well after playing the first two that, like, there's actually a lot. There's a lot of meat there. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of, like, uh, storytelling that I just ignored. Um, so I'm, like crawling through Dark Souls 3 and just combing every inch of it because I just want to know more about the world after like studying basically uh, Dark Souls 1 and 2 lore before this game came out and it's surprising like as far as I know this is the last this is what they've said the last game in this world like no more Dark Souls world after this uh, and they're going through great lengths at least so far to really connect like 3 and 1 there's a lot yeah. of like reoccurring characters uh, a lot of ideas of like these rebirth of old characters and stuff and where they've ended up and what's going on. Um, and to that aspect, because I'm playing that way with lore in mind, I'm really loving this game more than I enjoyed the first two. It's awesome. They've gone way out of their way to make sure the story takes a, a front seat in a way that it's never done before in a Dark Souls game. It's actually like one of the driving forces through the game, mm -hmm. uh, which is a little disconcerting, actually, because for people who just don't give a shit about it, you're kind of forced yeah. to look at it a little bit. Um, not that that should be necessarily a bad thing, but it does make you pay a lot more attention to it in a way you might not have normally. I think the Dark I feel Souls... like the... Oh, go ahead. No, I think the Dark Souls games don't really... I think with a lot of games that want you to be invested in their story, especially if it's an IP that isn't really familiar with a lot of people, they, they tend to take some liberties with how much they assume people will be willing to invest themselves in it, you know? And, like, I, I can't yeah. think of a particular example for that, but the, the gist of it being that if you are playing a new game for the first time and they have sort of a complex story, it's pretty likely that you're not really want to be invested in it because it's just, you know, it's a little too much and you'd rather just focus on the actual gameplay. But with Dark Souls, in I think they've got to, they've gotta, you know, like, this is such an integral part of it now, I guess, especially considering this is the third game 
in the series, there's got to be a story, you know? Like, the story has to be a part of it by this point. I think it's, uh, like, the franchise hinges on tone and atmosphere and mood Mm -hmm. much more than it actually hinges on, like, well, this is, like, an angry god, and you're going to go, like, slice him down, but first got to get this legendary weapon that, you know, also, you're going to fuck this lady, like, at some point. I'm not specifically trying to fire a shot at The Witcher 3, but as opposed to... (laughs) The Witcher 3 is, like, (laughs) like, it's, it's a story that is, I mean... The Witcher 3 is told comprehensively and well-written, yeah. and yeah. it's uh, it's robust. Whereas Dark Souls 3 kind of, like, buries... Well, Dark Souls in general buries that stuff and kind of says, like, if you want it, you can go look for it and try to piece it together yourself, and you almost have, like, a, a meta-mystery surrounding the game. But the I've never really been that into the lore of the Souls franchise, but I still find it interesting that it just establishes... Like, it, it's all in keeping with this tone of, like... You are like you don't belong here. Basically, like you don't know what you're doing. Everything's unfamiliar. They don't like they don't even hold your hand from a story standpoint. Outside of like the opening cutscene, which just kind of sets the stage for for who you're going to be killing later, probably. Um, and and I I kind of respect that more because it well it's novel and most games do a pretty poor job of telling a story that's interesting anyway for the most well, part that, like, that idea is more or less the antithesis of the quintessential like narrative of like the main story of a character the protagonist is the hero that the world is built around whereas what you're saying here with dark souls is that there's a world that you're thrust into that you had nothing to do with and now you're trying to figure it out right yeah mostly i just appreciate that you're not like a farmer from a small town whose wife was murdered by a demon, and then you gotta go kill the demon. And then he became a space marine. Then you became a space marine, you were on the first colony that Earth set up outside of the asteroid belt, and and a big space demon came down and murdered your wife. Those are tropes. Dark Souls definitely does not adhere to tropes in the way that so much of the media we deal with does, uh, which is probably why we're so refreshed by it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really something different. Maybe even subconsciously a part of it that really is appealing to people. And when I say that it seems like the most uh, story-focused, I mean, relatively speaking, compared to the other Dark Souls game, I'm not comparing it to, like, proper... Uh, mass media type things. It's not a story-driven game the way other games are. There's still a lot pretty buried that you have to kind of dig up. Oh, there's a lot buried, but there are incidences where you have to confront things that are story related in this that you didn't necessarily have to before. Yep, I agree. Definitely. When I finished the game, I found myself in a really odd spot, and I'm, again, I'm not going to spoil anything here, I'm just speaking generally, but I had a really hard time coming up with my overall feelings on the game uh, because it's not a bad game by any means, and I wouldn't even go so far as to put it in any category uh, that it would be negative. However, I felt a little bit hollow having finished it, and I'm not sure exactly where that comes from. Is that yeah, a that's pun? a great pun. Isn't yeah, it? I, didn't need it. I didn't need it. <laughs> I I really am not sure exactly what I was missing, and I've been trying to figure it out exactly what it was. So I've been getting way up my own ass about the whole thing, trying to figure <laughs> out what what I really appreciate it's about really Dark Souls. Really deep Barrett. in there. <clears throat> Seriously, because this is like this is stuff that most people wouldn't give a shit about, and this just personally is an issue for me. But like, here's where I landed, kind of. Uh, Dark Souls One, and the reason why I still think this is probably my favorite of the series. And again, this is not me shitting on three. I actually think it's really good. Um, the way that I see the level construction done in Dark Souls One is that it's sort of a pre-existing world that you're thrown into, whereas in two and three, you end up with a situation where the world is designed around the character. So the fact that it's a world that you then end up in, and the, the level design examples are like in Anne Orlando when you end up walking across that trellis or up that uh, the pole thing that you probably shouldn't have had any reason to walk up. It's just sort of like it's a, it's a bit of a leftover chunk of design that was done first and added a player to to do the pathing. Uh, whereas now things are sort of structured around. These are like the hallways and the corridors that the player goes down, and it's designed as sort of a gamey mechanism. Um, And I think this emphasis of going from it being a world that exists unto itself versus a game character that exists unto this world that we've created for it to be a video game seems apparent to me. And those are very subtle shades, but to me they seem to speak more apparently than maybe other things could. Um, But that's we're making the most minute of uh, distinctions because I still think it's good. Might have been a shade too hard toward the end for me. I ended up having to summon people, which I hate doing. I love to play the games completely by myself, which I know that's not really how you're supposed to play as a community-driven game and all that. 
but uh, you know, by the end, I was kind of like, all right, I'm kind of happy that's over now. It was getting a little to the bloodborne levels of frustration to me. Uh, but I also could just be bad. <laughs> that's that's just the argument that it boils down to at the end of the day, right? If you don't like Dark Souls three, you're probably just bad at it. That was me at okay. least with Dark Souls two. The uh, I mean, I, Dark Souls two is, in a way, I the the nicest thing I'll say about Dark Souls two without inspiring much argument, hopefully, is that I think it suffers the most because it is a huge departure from Dark Souls one mechanically in a way that people were really attached to like the use of life gems as opposed to estes flasks uh, yeah. particularly early in the game every time you die your hp gets lower like th annoying. those games yeah. those gave people like an obvious thing to complain about that is not invalid and dark souls 3 in a weird way i think is kind of being rewarded for being more derivative of dark souls 1 it's not to say that dark souls 2 deserves credit for being more original or, or taking risks yeah. but you know, it's more faithful as a sequel, I guess, than than the second one was. I think there's a little bit of a Pandora's box kind of effect that's happened with one to three. And it's mostly comparing one to three a lot of the time here because they seem the most similar um, in that there's a lot of tricks that they use in one that once you've seen them, that's sort of like their toolkit that they keep going back to. Mm. And there aren't that many options left for new ways to design for the player. So you end up seeing a lot of very similar tropes, uh, and I know I said that Dark Souls doesn't adhere to tropes, but as far as the design goes within itself, uh, it references itself maybe more than it should. So if you're very accustomed to the design of one, you'll go, oh, yeah, I remember when they did that in this area in one, uh, and that might not feel as fresh as maybe it could. And that's not even their fault, there's just only so many things you can physically do to evoke an emotion or to pass on the story or pass on what you're on. So... You know, it, it maybe ended up feeling a little bit shallow to me because of reasons that were simply just, it exists beyond one. Like, I could have only had that experience once ever, and it doesn't yeah. matter what you do after that. It's not their fault. It's just the, the way that the world works. And I think sense. there is, like, a little bit of that, like, first love thing for Dark Souls 1. Like, yeah. I, I would be, and a lot of people do like Bloodborne more than Dark Souls 1, but I would be amazed if a Dark Souls X could ever become, like, the majority consensus best Souls game in the franchise the way Dark Souls 1 is right now. Because, like you said, like, when you go into a Dark Souls game now and you're playing as, like, a sword and board character, you're like, okay, this guy is going to be, like, two hits. I know yeah. roughly what his attack animations are going to be, how to time it so I can actually kill him without using an Estus, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it, it is fair to say, like, when you go in and you fight, like, the early bosses, you're like, okay, shield up circle around, wait yeah, till he wait, finishes but... his attack flurry, and then, you know, do three or four hits. So, you know, you can never get back to that situation where you're like, oh, shit, there's the Taurus demon. I'm going to die, like, nine times yeah. trying to figure out how to deal with this guy. Um, and I think, you know, they, they have to... Uh, I, whatever they do next, if they're going to make another Souls game or another Souls-inspired game, they got to kind of throw people on the back foot or, or risk putting people... In a position where, like, Assassin's creed they might start to feel yeah. a little burnt out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, do you think, like, the reason people like Bloodborne maybe more than Dark Souls is just because they changed up the way the combat works? It's just a different way. It, it, it brings back maybe that more that mysticism of a game because you're like, okay, I don't have a shield. I can't play defensive. This is a game all about being as aggressive as possible. And just switching up just the game style would bring back... I mean, it's not going to bring back the magic of your first Dark Souls or Demon Souls, but... Even just changing co combat substantially like that can still bring back an air of mystery that maybe Dark Souls 3 lacks because we've played so much of 1 and 2. I know that the developer has toyed with the idea, or at least talked about and I've read about, uh, maybe, maybe the next world or thing he wants to do is like a, a not a steampunk, but like a, um, like a futuristic cyber ninja type world, Yeah, uh, which could be really cool. I think that'd be really, really fun. I personally don't think it's the combat that has to change. If anything, it's the pacing, because we get very accustomed to it being this uh, kind of a rote and repetitious cycle of here's a zone, explore that zone, find the bonfire, uh, push forward a little bit more, fight a boss, and then something changes. Like they, And I don't know if there's a lot of other ways to even do it and still have this formula work, because it is sort of dependent upon that tone of going from here's a point, I have to risk and reward to get to the next bonfire, not lose my, lose my souls and all that. Yeah. Um, and I think where it struggles a little bit, and this is one of the points where I think that Dark Souls 1 was still a little stronger than 3, is that they give you travel in instantly between bonfires on 3, whereas 1 you had to go through most of the game to get to it. The reason that's so important is because it establishes this really heavy weight 
of I can't go backward and I can't leave this zone until I can physically walk out of this zone. And that weight puts you in that character so much more, knowing that you have to actually act as if you're that character and make the most wise decisions you can. Yeah. Here, you can experiment, you can die, you can play around with it. I mean, granted, you could do that in the other one too if you just lose all your souls, but you're going to be collecting them either way. So why not play to that strength and have it be more about slower paced creeping through a zone instead of trying to rush through everything. And I think that's where this becomes a bit formulaic. It is ultimately the lion strat that prevails most of the time. You want to run through everything because it, it gets a little boring. You've done it once. You've seen all the mobs. You just run past them after that. Why bother fighting them again, especially when you don't know what's beyond that point? Right? You're dark wasting yeah. your own time. Yeah. I remember Dark Souls 2 being a little bit on the easier side because of the life gems. I didn't feel that risk because life gems are just so cheap to buy and you could just use them constantly. And if you ran out, you had Estus. Like, that threat yeah. was never there in Dark Souls 2 because you're just like, yeah, I have fucking 20 life gems. What do I care? I'll just back up and just crush a couple and I'll be fine. I sort of agree with Nick in the sense that, like, I find myself being like, if I have charted a path from bonfire, like the final bonfire in an area to the boss wall, and there's like 10 enemies in the way, like I'll fight them once, but I'm kind of like, why Why would I ever I fight them more than once, right? Yeah. If, if we're at this point where it's like, it's difficult enough uh, to beat the boss, then I'm probably gonna have to do it multiple times. But these okay. enemies, I can just run by. So like, why, why am I gonna make things hard? It's not like the game is too easy, and I need to make it harder by fighting those enemies. It's just like yeah. those enemies, weirdly enough, don't even have to exist. Like, they, they yeah. from a gameplay perspective, once you find that bonfire, they don't even really exist. Um, people are saying, like, Dark Souls 1 isn't different. That's true, but Dark Souls 1, I feel like most of us were probably a little bit still, we, we thought the game design was opaque in the sense that we're like, we're going to take a slower pace because we don't know that that actually works. On subsequent Dark Souls playthroughs, you just, you just run. You can rush through if you want to, yeah. Um, which I, I do I do find that in Dark Souls 3 where I'm like, man, if I, okay, I'm going to fight everybody in the air because if I don't, YouTube is going to be pissed. <laughs> but, and, and it is it is more fun to handle it that way or it feels more satisfying and rewarding in the end. But if I was, like when we were playing it through on the show yesterday, we were like, okay, here's Bonfire X. We have to go like Bonfire X down the stairs, take a right, Bonfire Y. Uh, and then there's the boss wall like right over there. Like just, I, I don't know what any of those enemies even like look like or do. I just know like yeah. the, how you actually like cheese it to get from bonfire to bonfire. And part of the problem is the fact that the AI is still pretty bad mostly, and you can cheese it just by knowing the language that Dark Souls has given us since yeah. one. It's always the same thing. They have a really hard time with verticality most of the time, small spaces. They don't know how to navigate. Uh, there's so many ways to exploit the AI that if you just don't want to deal with them, you don't have to. Yeah. So improving that would be a big start. But also, playing a bit to the strengths of Dark Souls 1 in that it wasn't so much about just being hardcore difficult, but more about the pacing and the atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, space the enemies out in such a way that occasionally they'll just be a bit easier, and encourage people not to spend so much time fighting the same ones over and over again. The best thing they did was when there was one big enemy that once you kill it once, it's gone forever, and yeah. it opens up a channel for you to not have to deal with that shit, because it's just boring to fight through the same ones. So do more of that and stop making it be about, oh, well, there's three archers here and then there's like five guys with spears. Just like you run past them every time. What's the point? So let me let me pose something rather extreme here then. Would Dark Souls be better suited as a boss rush game? It seems to be how they want to show it in a way. But no, I, the exploration for me is completely where it's at. Yeah. yeah. I'm not with Nick. Like the bosses are just kind of these Your big skill moments, checks. yeah, skill checks to, yeah. to kind of push mm. the story forward. For me, I just I wanna, I wanna search every nook and cranny and see as much of the yeah. game as I can because the world is the most interesting to me. And and it feels like that's the departure that I've got with their own ethos is that they really want this to be a hardcore game for hardcore people who love to fight bosses. And it's 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 got that gamer element to it that I don't like as much. And I want it to be a game about exploration and atmosphere more so. I mean, I, I put up with it, and I, I even like it to some point, because the combat is intrinsically fun, yeah. but I think the better game would still be as if they really emphasize the atmosphere over the boss fights. Hmm. So you're, even, you're, you're going a step in the other direction, then. You're saying that the boss fights aren't even necessarily the focal point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
They're okay. a part of the game, and they're a part of the game world, and I wouldn't want them to completely take them away or anything. But it just feels now like the point of the game in their eyes is to get you from point A to a boss every time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There should be more to it than that. That's where it becomes formulaic. There, there are interesting uh, points crossing there, though, with Mathis uh, suggesting that this is uh, an iteration in the Dark Souls franchise that is more focused on putting the player into positions where he gets to experience the lore and gets to explore a little bit more, at least compared to the other ones. Do you still feel like that's true, or is that not really in line with what you think about it, Nick, in particular? I Wait, can you rephrase that? I so, didn't totally with, understand. With, with what Mathis said earlier, he was mentioning that the Dark Souls 3 in particular, uh, he feels is the game in the franchise that gives you a lot more opportunities to actually get invested in the lore. It's sort of like yeah. it puts it in your face more than, I guess, Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2 did. Would you say yeah. that's true, too? Well, I was saying that earlier, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm, cool. All right. Well, there we go. I think we're... Uh, I think we're all, I mean, we, we nitpick quite a bit on games like this, and I think it's just more to be able to actually criticize uh, well, most of the Well, when you time, love but... a game, you, you, the yes. more you play it, the more you're going to exactly. start picking it apart. That's all it is. You're going to we'll find the aspects. We'll be doing a lot more Gungeon. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You're going to find the aspects that you wish were better because you want, you want the best for a game that you love. We mm -hmm. love Dra Dark Souls 3. It's great. It's also the third game in a franchise that hasn't changed its formula too much. So those yeah. negative, negatives start showing themselves even more mm -hmm. after three iterations of a very similar game. To say that Dark Souls 3 is vastly different than Dark Souls 1 and 2 is just a, bl a blatant lie. Yeah. The same weaknesses that were in 1 yeah. and 2 persist in 3. But Period. they did improve on some of the systems that they kind of screwed with a little bit in 2, which is the emphasis on life gems is gone. It's just Estus yep. uh, or Ashen Estus, mm -hmm. which is kind of a nice thing, too, to be able to make that decision how much of a magic caster you're going to be and allocate your FP that way. Yep. Um, and they went back to the original system with the way humanity worked in a way, which is now embers, um, in that it's a, it's a positive reinforcement versus a negative detraction to your health bar. Whereas every time you would die in two, it would make your health bar shorter. That's no longer a thing. You Thank only God. lose the bonus of having been kindled or human, uh, which I is, I think, a much better way to do it. Right. You know, speaking about the whole, like, it's a hardcore game for hardcore gamers, I feel like Dark Souls 3, 2 was probably the worst offender yes. of like difficulty for difficulty's sake because dark souls one was so hard oh you're gonna shit your pants yeah. playing dark yeah. souls 2 I'm gonna... there were so many weird design decisions in dark souls 2 that made it giant knights with tracking arc attacks that fall <laughs> down like, on you losing how, like, maximum like, health every time you die and then at the same time then there was like well also you have life gems which are really easy it just felt so mm -hmm. weirdly designed every time you die the lead dev comes to your house and punches you in the dick dark <laughs> souls 2 <laughs> Yeah. It's gotta, it's gotta do that though, because for me, I'm not saying like there's a lot of things in Dark Souls 2 I don't enjoy, and it is probably my least favorite of the three. But it's gonna take a while for me to tease that out, depending on how the rest of three goes. Right. Yeah, yeah. But the thing that gets me going in Dark Souls as a franchise, not as Dark Souls One, is that idea of like you, you were basically playing this against yourself because you could just choose to stop playing the game at any time. So you're basically saying, like, I'm going to take on this challenge, and I'm going to die over and over and over. I'm going to feel unfamiliar, and then I'm going to make incremental progress, and then eventually, you know, there's those brief moments of glory. Yeah. Like, I, that is the Dark Souls experience for me. It's not necessarily, like, oh, you know, what's going on here? Like, what, what is the mystery, I guess, in this situation? Yeah. It's more like I'm testing myself to see if I have the determination, basically, to do this. Like, I think anybody could basically beat... Dark Souls. I don't think it makes you a hardcore gamer to beat Dark Souls on anything but, like, the donkey bongos. But, <laughs> like, I, I feel like anybody given enough time could beat Dark Souls fairly easily. Dark Souls know? is and a, a puzzle game in a way. Once you beat it, you, it's, you can do it every time. Like, once yeah. you've got the secrets down, once, you've, once you die to a boss a hundred times, you've, like, paid the toll to beat it every second or third try or even every try from that point onwards. So... I like the I, I like that it like beats you down and it's like by the way, um, you know you're a weak piece of shit. But this lonely isolation that you feel, everybody's feeling it at the same time, and that's what brings us all together. And you can you know surmount your previous self and prove that you are you know good enough to beat this. And then I, I appreciate that it's not just like you died four times, so let Luigi beat the level for you. You know, like yeah. <laughs> 
But isn't that sort of where the disconnect started was that people took away from Dark Souls 1 that the most important element of it was its difficulty when actually the real thing about Dark Souls 1 was that it wasn't that hard of a game. It was just a complicated language to learn. And once you've learned that language, then it isn't difficult at all. It's actually very fair. Mm. Uh, It's it's punishing in the sense that you don't lose like 2% of your HP every time you make a mistake. Right. If you if you never make a mistake, there's many opportunities to never take damage. But if you make a mistake, you're going to be like 60% dead or something. That's where I think a lot of the design deci- the bad design decisions of the second game came in. So People cool, learned they the got language. the wrong lesson from yeah. that because it became more mainstream or they wanted that more mainstream appeal and that mm-hmm. comes from accentuating the thing that the most people believed to be what the point of the game was. I know I'm so far down the damn rabbit hole. I mean, yeah, Dark Souls you know, is a lot honestly. of things to a lot of people. <laughs> I mean, some people really appreciate the difficulty of the boss fights and how good it feels to overcome that adversity. Some people love to find the cool secrets hidden through everything. Some people love the lore. Some people love the PvP. Some people love the community. All of those things are valid reasons to love Dark Souls. And I'm not trying to shit on anyone for any one of those individual opinions. I'm just giving you my own side of things. That's all. Mm-hmm. I think, yeah, Dark we, Souls we've 3. gone pretty deep yeah. down it, as you mentioned. So yeah. Oh, yeah, know. absolutely. I, I will all... say I'm probably going to play Bloodborne after this now and like try and beat it because I'm, I'm itching for more of it. I I think honestly I'm going to try Bloodborne one day because Bloodborne seems to ha- have sort of like an approachability to it that uh, two and three for me don't. I don't even know what I would mostly attribute that to. Maybe just being on a console alone. It would be not that these aren't obviously, but you know. Anyway, it's not yeah. here there. Also, I want to know the fact that if... I can only play it on PS4 is the, <laughs> is that the main <laughs> Uh, also do you think the people that made those bongo drums they must have known that they weren't really making a peripheral for a single game they were actually creating a speed running category when they made those things (laughs) the amount of games that have the donkey kong bongo drums as a as a valid category i'd like to see that list i want to i want to compete there too dark souls 3 try try feet percent man yeah Oh, that We God. tried to play Enter the Gungeon when Ryan Clark from Crypt of the Necrodancer <laughs> was here. Mm-hmm. We Shame tried to play it. Enter the Gungeon on the dance pad. Oh, and wow. it was going to be like one person moving on the dance pad and then somebody else holding the mouse and shooting and rolling. Mm-hmm. And then the third person on controller <laughs> just trying to keep them alive. It, it didn't work. Like, it didn't accept the dance pad as a valid I, controller, unfortunately. Well, I love the idea at the very least. Yeah. Not yeah. the concept. Okay, Dark Souls 3, 60 bucks available on Steam right now. Next up in our docket is Ratchet and Clank. Ratchet and Clank, the new PS4 game, is the remake, reboot, re release, reimagining of the original PS2 launch in 2002, I want to say. Probably 2001, 2002. I think uh, it was 2002. Yeah. Uh, Ratchet and Clank, of course, a game that is. Spawned a number of uh, spin-offs over the years. Been out for over a decade now. About uh, okay. So the original release of Ratchet and Clank. Let me get let me get the whole Google list up here for you guys to see. Do it. Ratchet and Clank. You got Ratchet There's and Clank up your arsenal. Ratchet and Clank Future Tools of Destruction. Ratchet and Clank Going Commando. Ratchet and Clank. Ratchet and Clank Future A Crack in Time. Ratchet and Clank Into the Nexus. Ratchet and Clank, Clank Collection, which I guess doesn't really <laughs> count considering that's a collection of the group of them there. Ratchet and Clank All for One, Ratchet and Clank Size Matters, Ratchet and Clank Full Frontal Assault, Ratchet and Clank Future Quest for something, something, and Secret Agent Clank, which was a... Don't uh, forget... Spinoff. Yeah. Don't forget about Ratchet and Stank, colon, who farted. (laughs) You know, it would have followed along with their prior theme. Sure. So now we've got Ratchet and Clank, just the straight-up reboot reimagining. I played it, I know Nick has been playing it as well, right? Uh, Yeah, I finished it. Have you been checking it out? I will not play this game. You Neither will not I. play this game. Is that even, if it's a, <laughs> even if it's a masterpiece, I will not play this game. What's that about? I'm just not interested. All right. Fair enough. And I resent... Further, I resent the notion that all good pieces of media need Must to be universally be consumed. Exactly. <laughs> we live in a world with uh, unlimited amounts of good media. Some of it you have to self-select out. Otherwise, you're just never going to get anything done. There's 10 seasons of legendary television coming to Netflix every day. Oh, the smartest people in human history are writing books, and they come out, and you go, oh, you know, it's pretty good. It changed my life, but whatever. Was it worth 10 bucks? 
I'm not, I'm not trying to put you on blast here, man. It sounded like you, you had more of like happened. a... I don't know. You got very upset. Very upset. It sounded like you had more like a personal vendetta against Insomniac. Or something. I, I will never play Ratchet and Clank. How, how have they ever been controversial? They're like the, the friendliest game franchise of all time. Only I got nothing fighting. against it. Yeah, I got no, I got nothing against uh, everyone's favorite Lombax. Mm-hmm. I'm just it's unlikely for See, me to uh, it's unlikely for me to play it. You know he's a Lombax, so I know you at least have like a a slight investment. There's a in little the tongue in cheek going in, in here, mm-hmm. I think maybe <laughs> just a little. Nick, tell me about Ratchet and Clank. <laughs> all right, I'm a big fan of Ratchet and Clank. I have loved this series since its inception. I've bought all of them uh, up until a point. I think I got. Uh, somewhere into the PS3 versions, and then I kind of trailed off. So the idea of a reboot sounded like a big deal to me, and I wanted to be involved in this. Um, So I got a copy. Sony provided me with a copy, uh, and I got to play it. Uh, They provided it for free because they wanted me to say that. Um, Game is, like, better than average, but not amazing is kind of where I'm going to land on it. I saw a lot of really good reviews for it. And I think the big thing that comes down to it for me is that they really emphasize storytelling in this one because of the fact that it's a movie tie-in, which is, like, not where my loyalty lies for that game at all because I really don't care much about the story or the characters. It's really about the action and the the guns and the silliness. Um, the co- uh, The comedy, which is the other main thing of it, they really tried to be edgy a few times with a bunch of jokes that just did not land at all. Mm. Uh, so it was, like, aggressively unfunny to me, which... <laughs> Is oh not a great God. mark for it. That's not a good box quote either. Aggressively no. unfunny, Rock Lee. I'm getting style. the bad stuff out of the way first, though. <laughs> okay. Oh, dude, you know who's in the Ratchet and Clank movie? Who? Uh, no, no, no way. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited to be playing Victor Von Ion, Chairman Drex, villainous <laughs> robot lieutenant. No. <laughs> but what slag is to be a bad guy, you know? Tired of saving the world. That's the best. I like it. That's exciting new news. <laughs> uh, that is really weird, though. I didn't know that. It yeah. was a big moment for me. <laughs> okay, continue, Nick, So the, the premise here, uh, the basic way the storytelling is being done is it's from the perspective of Captain Quark, uh, who, if you're not familiar, is kind of like the uh, uh, Zap Brannigan from Futurama combined with the Tick. He's just like this over-the-top superhero that's... He thinks he's funny, he thinks he's a good guy or whatever, but he's actually just kind of a fuck-up in every way. Um, so he, he's telling the story about why he's in jail to this other inmate. Um, and this is the first cutscene you see. And apparently the cutscenes are, like, taken right out of the movie, which is also kind of odd. Oh, really? Um, I didn't know that. That is interesting. doesn't play well for YouTube because you will get content ID match in one second. Um, mm. Not that that matters for the purposes of reviewing the game. I'm just saying, well, it does if you're trying to put up content for it, yeah. but for us... Fair um, warning and so, for those of you looking to do that, I guess. Yeah, yeah they structured it sort of like Bastion <laughs> a little bit, like that Captain Quark is narrating your every move for the first few missions, right. which is like kind of annoying because I really don't like his voice. Um, personally, I, maybe it doesn't bother everybody. Mm. Uh, but you go on the, the typical origin quest for uh, Ratchet meeting Clank and Ratchet becoming part of the, the Interstellar Academy, or I forgot already what they call themselves. Space Rangers? Space Rangers, that's right. Gotcha. You didn't even play it. Yeah, <laughs> you still didn't. <laughs> Good call. Um, so you do a couple little missions, and then the world sort of opens up a little bit, and then you get like a handful of planets to choose from. You kind of go on from there, and then it's supposed to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, another thing I had an issue though is as you start, it, the pacing is really slow at the beginning. It's so heavily story focused. You hardly get a chance to play for more than maybe ten or fifteen minutes at a time before they take control away for another cutscene or another exposition moment, introduce another character, tell you about some kind of tech tree upgrades you can get. It's like just let me play the game for a few minutes consecutively, please. Yeah. Uh, about halfway through the game, though, they do finally get into the meat where there's like one huge open planet that you can really explore and take your time. Unfortunately, there's like two of those planets that exist in the totality of the game. So the structure of it was a bit disappointing there. However, when the game is playing at its best, it is structurally, thumbs up, Ratchet and Clank. It is exactly what you want it to be. Mm. It is uh, it's incredibly fast, it's explosive, it's beautiful to look at. The game is stunning graphically the whole way through. Agreed. And you can get away with the eye candy uh, and, and some of the slower pacing because it's so pretty. Uh, the soundtrack's really nice, and uh, the way they did the weapon upgrades are also quite nice too. Um, in fact, they structure it the way they did in the past Ratchet and Clank, where you kind of have to do two playthroughs to get all the stuff. Um, so that's fun if you get really into Ratchet it. One is Ratchet and one is Clank, of course. Yes, exactly. Um, 
they have you finding the usual golden bolts and things, uh, you know, exploring, solving problems for NPCs, meeting new people, uh, and it plays out like a typical Ratchet and Clank game. It just takes a really long time to get going. Um, it does. So what were your experiences? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think the, the slow pacing at the start sort of turned me off a little bit. Uh, I'm about five or six hours in now, I'd say, and I really, really like it. I think it's uh, extremely good, actually. I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan. Uh, as uh, uh, Same case with you, by the way. Uh, Sony did send me a copy, and they wanted us to mention that they uh, provided us the copy. So thank you very much, Sony, for sending us the thank copies you, of Ratchet & Clank. Uh, the, the gameplay itself, it is quintessential Ratchet & Clank, and that is exactly what I was looking for in it, too, and I was really satisfied to find that that was the case. It was more or less the same sort of gameplay that I loved and uh, admired the first four. That was mostly what I enjoyed out of Ratchet and & Clank, and I'm sure you kind of feel the same way, was just how fluid and how uh, tight the controls are for a yeah. platforming game like this, where you're dancing around a lot, you're switching between weapons and stuff, you're, you've got a big variety of weaponry uh, in the game. Not a huge, it's not like, you know, Gungeon-style weapon variety, but it's a decent selection with a, with a pretty good... Um, actual variety of things that the weapons do. For example, of course, you've got like your uh, Groovatron, which is going to shoot out that disco ball and make all of your enemies dance. You've That's got... the one you choose first. That's like the worst gun in the whole game. Oh, I know, but it's so <laughs> awesome. The casual bear. Uh, the freaking Groovatron and the Pixelator are like, why did you give us these guns at all? Why? I don't even I want these. I love the Pixelator. That was my second one I was going to talk Isn't about. Isn't the Pixelator the only new, game, the only new gun they introduced to the game and everything else is from the first game? They, I, I honestly don't know. I couldn't tell you. There were, there were probably like a lot of similarities, and I imagine that's by design. In fact, one of the oh, yeah. uh, one of the early cutscenes actually, I loved it. Uh, the the guy is just straight up breaking the fourth wall, talking about like, "All right, well, I'll see you in the next reboot," and then it's just like he's never yeah. a character again. So, you know, like I, I like that too. I, as Nick said, I I thought it was pretty funny, you know, but it is it's more geared toward a younger audience, especially as far as holding your hand uh, in the early stages as well. Uh, it's it's fairly easy to get through, and it's, uh, it, it is pretty on rails a lot of the time. The levels aren't really that varied either, I, fa I found up to this point at least. It's just uh, kind of a lot of the same stuff, and there's not a lot of places to explore either, which is sort of unfortunate. No. And uh, I, I, this may be the nostalgia goggles to a certain extent, but I remember there being a lot of freeform exploration and uh, secret places to get to and different ways to use your different gear that you ac acquire in the first yes. of the original Ratchet and Clank, and I didn't feel nearly as much of that, or at least I haven't yet, uh, in the in the reboot here. You so that's generally don't. Yeah. They're very straightforward with how they use the weapons and, and gadgets that you get, and they also don't really give you much fanfare when you unlock something new or find something new. It's just like, oh, here it is, and now you've got it. Yeah, it's just sort of like <laughs> it's ex it's expected, right? It's like, okay, now this is the part of you remember this, right? In the first game, we're Ratchet and Clank. This is where you got that weapon. That's Yay. exactly that tone that you just said. You remember this yeah. is kind of how they approached a lot of the big moments in the game, which felt really underwhelming. They yeah. don't kind of treat it as its own source material. They treat it as like an add-on to the original Ratchet & Clank, which is not how a reboot works. Exactly. But uh, while, while saying that, I do want to also restate that I really like it quite a bit. I think it's just it's pure fun. This is the kind of game that is just so much fun to pick up and play. Works well on the PS4. This actually gave me some sort of like rekindled confidence in my PS4 again as a console, given like the, like the past three or four games that I've tried to play on it, like Firewatch, the Final Fantasy XV beta, uh, even everybody's gone to the Rapture to a certain extent had some performance problems, so I'm really happy to see that Ratchet and Clank is not only running smoothly, it's like a pretty yeah. consistent FPS, but also just looks so good. So uh, that is really encouraging. It it should have been a launch title, to be honest. Like it's the oh, game yeah. they needed in their in their catalog to sell PS4s because it's so freaking pretty. And having not played a Ratchet and Clank game in years, like it looks like a Pixar movie so much of the time. I was kind of shocked by how good it looks. Yeah. Which is not a thing I say about console games very often at all. No, I totally uh, agree with you. So it's... I can't give them any more credit for how good the graphics are. Like, no doubt, it is top-notch in that way. The production value in general is really good. Mm -hmm. uh, and the game plays really smoothly. And, like, the when you when you smash a shitload of boxes and all the bolts go flying into the air and then suck into you, like, that effect yeah. is so cool every single time. Yeah, no, they... they <laughs> I never got bored of it. You nailed it, exactly. Just, like, little things like that are what makes the gameplay of Ratchet & Clank so satisfying. I mean, like, you can even just see it if you're watching on the live feed of just the, the action going on on screen right now. Like, it, it feels as satisfying as it looks the majority of the time, yeah. so it is really nice there. 
Uh, and I'm not implying the PS4 didn't sell well when it came out. I'm just implying that like they could have used a little better of a launch catalog. This and Ratchet and Clank would have been dead on. This Are you forgetting about consoles, Knack? Man. I know. <laughs> Knack There's, was not so pretty. For... Knack. There's not room for two 3D platformer masterpieces at the oh, same time. They launch. picked the wrong damn one, is my opinion. <laughs> um, there was a couple of little, like, odd things, though, that I noticed, like, with regard to how they did the characterization and stuff. Like, when you meet up with Clank, you'd think that would be, like, a really big deal. But, like, Ratchet and yeah. Clank hardly ever talk to each other through the entire game. Like, there's no rapport between them at all that I can pick up on. Which, mm -hmm. it's, like, the stupidest, smallest thing. It doesn't really matter, but it just felt a little off to me. No, I And the other thing is... Oh, go ahead. No, just real quick. That just I think that correlates with what you said earlier, which is that they sort of just assume that a lot of people have already been, become familiarized with these yeah. characters up to this point. They're not really... And, and there was, Sorry, there was yeah, a bit of go. dissonance uh, with regard to the, the character's father figure. Because like, I don't really know the backstory of Ratchet, and I, yeah, I mostly don't care that much either, but like... <laughs> At the beginning of the game, he's in a garage with this dude who apparently cares a whole bunch about him enough to have like a picture of him on his desk uh, where they're like posing like father and son. And you get pulled away from that home world very quickly and then you go off on your journey, which is a you know, big transformative experience for this guy. And I came back like halfway through the game thinking that when I went back to visit this father figure, he would like give a shit about me. And there was not even a prompt to talk to him. Like, you could walk into the garage, and you would just stand next to him and jump up and down, and he's just sitting there beating away with his wrench or whatever. <laughs> give a good God damn. You've been, a, you've been to eight different planets since you were last there. He doesn't give a shit. I've made the news, like, a billion times, and this dude doesn't even want to say hi to me? Like, what happened between the two of us? He's that angry? You it abandoned him, man. Weird. Yeah. Like, there's so much detail in some places, but, like, other places are just very sparse. So. Yeah. Inconsistency, I suppose. Mm. Uh, overall, I'm going to go ahead and say that it's a uh, very positive, glowing recommendation from me personally. I had just such a good time with it. I honestly see it as, like, Nick, you, you say it would have been a great launch title. I really think this is a console yeah. mover. Like, this is such a great game. It's awesome. I'm in the, like, the 7 out of 10 kind of category for my, my love for it. I do think people should play it. If they're any, uh, fans of Ratchet & Clank, you should play it. Uh, but don't go in expecting it to be, like, a life-changing experience. It's just, it's another Ratchet & Clank game, and it's good. Mm. I think it, uh, I, I have not played, I think I've played like three of the aforementioned, whatever it was, maybe dozen Ratchet and Clank games that have come out. And uh, yeah. I've, I've generally enjoyed like every single one I've played, but this one definitely stuck with me a little bit more. I think this is the, the cream of the crop for him here, for Insomniac with this series. Uh, and that, I believe, is it. Yeah, Ratchet and Clank available on the PS4 right now. I believe it's 40 bucks. Uh, it's also not 60 bucks. bucks. Yeah, it's only 40 bucks. Wow. So there you go. A little That's bit of a, odd. Yeah, actually, that it's forty bucks. Yeah, it, it, it bucks? is. It is not a forty dollars title. That that is uh, certainly noteworthy. This this is a full fledged AAA game. If I ever saw one, Insomniac. I mean, obviously they've released several AAA games in their lifetime. So I don't know. Maybe this is uh, the forty dollars price tag. May be indicative of good things in the future. Hopefully, I'm I'm or totally fine indicative with indicative that Focus Features is subsidizing twenty dollars out of each purchase. To put in a free ticket to see Ratchet and Clank yeah, at your local the AMC theaters. Mm -hmm. I see. Oh, okay. There's, no, there's the tie-in. Yeah, no, there's absolutely the the tie-in. I didn't think about it from that perspective. That's mm -hmm. probably something to do with it. <laughs> don't 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 let it ruin your facade, though. Maybe if you That's felt better before matter. you thought about that. Let that I'm not that saying place. it's an advertisement. It sounds like it's good. Well, I mean, it but is. it's like sort of an advertisement. Yeah. All right. Big Bumpin' was an advertisement. It was still a great game. There you go. <laughs> Ratchet Clank, Big 40 bucks bumpin'. on the PS4. Uh, I am... I want to touch real quick on the Banner Saga 2, because I'm pretty sure I'm the only one that played it, right? Okay. Yeah, I have not played it yet. Real As quick. Of right now, yeah. Just do want to mention, the Banner Saga 2, it is pretty damn good. I was paid to play it on my Twitch channel, so my opinion is probably uh, solid and worthless, but... Banner Saga 2, sequel to the Banner Saga. It's a, a turn-based strategy game. Gorgeous. Another beautiful game. A completely different style, though, of course, this one. But absolutely beautiful. Love it. The, the narrative and exposition in the Banner Saga has always been one of its strong points. Uh, absolutely so in the Banner Saga 2 as well. I think the writing is absolutely exceptional. Uh, the characters are very interesting. I, I got invested in them. Even just having played a little bit of the first Banner Saga to sort of familiarize myself with the uh, format of the game. But then I ended up watching the recap 
of the first game in the second, and then continuing, of course, right on into the story for the second. It's uh, it's pretty captivating. I I began to get interested in the story they were crafting here. Uh, I love the the textures, the visuals, everything, the way people look, the way ships look, the way the environments look, all just completely draw me in. And the sense of scale that it creates is pretty mesmerizing as well. So uh, I'm going to say glowing recommendation. And again, I will mention that this was a... Uh, I was paid to play this on Twitch by the publisher versus Evil, but uh, I just... I think it's pretty goddamn outstanding. It's a small audience for this one as well. Uh, certainly not the most approachable uh, well, not really. They, they're kind of going into niches uh, across different spectrums here. Like the, the Viking lore is uh, maybe a little bit niche along with the turn-based strategy crowd is probably a little bit smaller than, say, things like platformers or roguelikes or things like that. But uh, if you are at all interested in either of those things, or better yet, the combination of the two, the Banner Saga is a, an uh, absolutely good choice. So... I recommend it. I, I really like the Banner Saga 1. In fact, it was my game of the month in January of 2014. I remember oh, that. Shit. However, I got bummed out because I was like, this game's really good. And then it finished, and it was like, basically it said, like, come back next year for the <laughs> sequel. Oh, and I was yeah. like, oh, I, I was under the impression that this was a standalone experience. And it, it kind of left a, a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth, but I still really like the game. And I'll probably oh. check it out. I hear that the sequel is better. It wasn't just pumped out in like no time flat, which is, uh, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, they they put time into it, and it it really is a beautiful looking game. I heard that uh, from a strategy standpoint, they've added new victory conditions as well. Like it's not just you have to get all of the enemies' power and toughness down to mm -hmm. to zero. Now there's like alternative paths there. I ran into one that I know of, maybe another that I'm not 100% familiar with, but I know there was one instance where uh, if we could isolate, like, okay, so I'll, I'll spoil it a little bit here, but there was a fight where the enemy team had a couple of battle bears, which was fucking okay. awesome. And nice. uh, <laughs> there, was, there was a win condition wherein if we eliminated everything but one bear, then we would capture a bear and we would use it on our team later on. So there's probably a few That's of those. Cool. The round table did. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it still does it still do the thing where it's like as an enemy uh, or even your your own players as they lose HP, their attacks become less effective as well. I think so. Yeah, it's probably statistically different though. So they have the they have that same uh, health and armor values that's been the sort of the staple of the Banner yeah. Saga gameplay, and that's that's sticking around. They're using the willpower still as well. Uh, I think there are different, like, associations made with weaknesses. I know they have, like, the, the injury system is still there as well, where you're weakened based mm. on your uh, results from the previous fight. I don't know exactly whether or not they, they retain that, uh, that debuff system, though, but I know they, they certainly have uh, different conditions that can apply across battles. The That's combat cool. is uh, just as good, though. Uh, strategically, it's really sound. Uh, I was terrible at it, but that's mostly j just because I didn't understand a lot of it uh, for the first few fights. It's kind of forgiving, too, though, honestly. Like, for as terrible as I was doing, I was getting kind of party wipes for uh, the first couple of fights, but I, it just progressed mm -hmm. anyway, which I liked about it. Like, you know, it, it, it moves on. It just says, well, you know, you, you got your ass kicked, but thus is the lay of the land. Now let's see if you can figure out how to get past that and, you know, rise from the adversity. So instead of just resetting and make you, making you fight that same fight again, which I was going to dread, by the way, because these fights take, like, you know, between 30 and 45 minutes to complete. Uh, yeah. It was, it was instead just a little bit more focused on the narrative, which I really appreciated. Um, I never played the first one, so it's something that I own. I, I want to play just because I enjoy turn-based strategy stuff in general. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, yeah, I've heard the second one's great, and I assume your decisions from the first one carry over to the second one. Yeah, you, so... can, you can import in the, in the beginning, yeah. Yep. Does it have a, um, you know, like a Mass Effect-style, like, Comic if this bookie. happened, would... Well, I, I, yeah, just like a way to basically replay the game and the important choices before you play... The Banner Saga one or the Banner Saga two without playing the whole game through again to import it. Yeah, you can, and it's got it's got those you know Mass Effect dialogue choices that will impact your uh, progression different differently. In fact, I'm pretty sure you can go so far as to like alter your actual path uh, on the map toward getting to where you want to go based on what you say. So it is interesting there as well. 
Uh, it's got it's cool. got some good replay value. I don't think me personally. I don't think it would ever be a game that I would want to play through twice, just because uh, I I tend to go through games like this and then just sort of accept the story that happened to me as you know basically lore and just go yeah. from there. So personally, I'll I'll well I I actually probably will just shelve it where I am because I'm about five or six hours and. I've gotten my fill, you know. I I, I don't necessarily need to AKA see all the, 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 end. the checks have stopped coming in. <laughs> right. I was right. say, we got the hourly rate done. is through. No, it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, it, it it stayed its welcome, and I had a pretty good time with it. And uh, I think if you are, as I mentioned, if you're interested in uh, pretty narrative heavy games, turn based strategy, we've had quite a few really good turn based strategy games coming up lately too. So if you're uh, if you're a fan of that genre, I'm sure you've got plenty mm. on your list. But this is uh, uh this is one I'd me. add to it. Mathis and I have a game to talk about. It's called Paladins. Do need to tell you we are being sponsored by Hi Res to play this. Um, yep. Big ups to Hi Res. Probably the best company on earth. Uh, Paladins right. is a ten out of ten masterpiece. It deepest actually, pockets, our deepest strategy on mm -hmm. this side of any MOBA. It has transformed uh, my life in on an emotional and even metaphysical level that I didn't fuck realize. Fuck you. Fuck you. <laughs> you're a dick. <laughs> it's a but. Uh, I'm just saying it's probably the game that single-handedly makes me believe that the medium can be art at its best, at least, when handled by a company with such a deft touch as Hi-Rez Studios. Ratchet and Clank. Uh, I'll probably code, play this game for the rest of it. Code provided to me for free, courtesy of Sony. I just want to mention that, uh, Sony, if you're out there, I would just I would just suck all your dicks. Just If you want to whip them out collectively, just put them in my mouth. Nom, nom, nom. I like them. I <laughs> I'm like a little bit games. more in the middle about it. Like, you you guys can keep your dicks in your pants. I appreciate that you sent me a game, but like that's about as far as that goes. Okay. Yeah, but Paladins though is. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since I've started playing it, I've just noticed a weird thing. Mathis, you can corroborate it. I'm not gonna put words okay. in your mouth, but it's probably universally true. My body no longer uh, needs to consume organic <laughs> energy in order to fuel its biological processes. I've found that I think maybe the game is teaching me how to photosynthesize and and as a result i'm freed from you know this mortal obligation to consume energy for fuel you might fucking... be the character you're playing because my I, i've learned to naturally blend in and stealth into my surroundings and and becoming much more uh dexterous and nimble for the as sake well. of the audience i'm not sure if the comedy now has gone out the other end or not like whether people know Speaking where we of are which since playing paladins i no longer shit out of my asshole <laughs> Uh, now comes out of my nose, but it's that's not it's, better. That's not, not an improvement because I'm not eating any organic energy. It's actually <laughs> it's seeds. They're delicious chia Try seeds. Try putting a quartz is... crystal in your asshole, and maybe you'll get sponsored uh. for something else. Go so, paladins.com and download the game right now. Fucking getting me to Google <laughs> shit just in case you actually wanted to have a conversation about something so that I could have some <laughs> some you know helpful B-roll footage, but no. No, it's going to be that. All right. That's fair. P A Aladdin's. Paladin. P Aladdin's. 2016. I like that better. You guys want to yeah. I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and uh shelve Gungeon cuz I'm sure we will have plenty more opportunities to talk about that. Uh in favor of getting people where they need to be and rounding up the show appropriately which is now an appropriate segue to say it's time for everybody's favorite segment it's ask roundtable ask roundtable is brought to you by the people that send in questions to roundtableyt at gmail.com and today's question comes from simon simon What's says up, simon? how you doing buddy uh -huh. has there ever been a moment in gaming that was so dramatic for you that you wish you could either experience it for the first time again or never have had experienced it at all now, for Ryan, I'm sure that was the uh, the phosphorus field in Spec Ops: The Line. I know that was just no, such a heavy game for you. <laughs> I'm, I'm never gone again. I'm glad you got to me because uh, I think probably the first time I pushed an enemy's vault in in Paladins was something that I would. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. Is the joke we shouldn't do sponsorship? Because we're going to do some, like, right after this. <laughs> I don't like... know. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, God. Do you have, a, do you have an actual answer, you, you fucking asshole? Uh, a, a video game moment that was so dramatic, I had to what? 
You had to, well, okay, so the question in its entirety, asked by Simon, who we appreciate. Thank you, Simon, for your question. Has there ever been a moment in gaming that was so dramatic for you that you wish you could either experience it for the first time again or never have had experienced it at all? Mmm. That was, so it's not just like that was dumb, I wish I hadn't experienced that. It's, it's more like that is, it's so impactful mm -hmm. and like emotionally exhausting that, mm -hmm. okay. You're on um, Impactful and emotionally exhausting. <laughs> like, simultaneously. Pa pa pass it around and I'll, I'll see if I can come sure up with thing. something. Mathis, you got anything for me? Uh, no. You didn't have anything. <laughs> no. He gave us the question before the podcast. But, like, I did. I gave you not, prep there time. Is no, there is not a single game that has ever been like, Nothing? Oh, God, my life is... Why in, are you even in, in this field? Uh, because I enjoy playing video games. But you clearly have zero passion for them if they that never emotionally impact you. That time in the when I got my girl hooked on meth, <laughs> and then she would serve all of my needs immediately. Listen, it was cocaine, first of all. No, this is no, no, I don't think there's a moment within a game that was just like so incredible to me that just like blew me out of the water that I, I want to experience it again and again. There were a couple times where it was just like, it was emotional. Mm hmm. Uh, the ending of Red Dead Redemption was pretty emotional to me, I guess. I thought that was a, a pretty that's, good ending. That's a good choice. I like that, yeah. Uh, See, I'm I really trying, enjoyed, to, I'm no, trying to make you like... okay with crying, man. It's alright. You can feel. You can let them know you feel. Um, but I, I don't... I don't... No, you can't. Alright. <laughs> that's a good answer. <laughs> I like that. No, Red Dead Redemption, I remember that. That was, that was a heavy moment, man, and that... Does it, now, did that make you get to the point where you wish you could experience that again, or was that more of just your... that That's probably uh, the strongest emotional attachment maybe you probably felt? The, yeah, I think that was probably the strongest emotional attachment that I had. Maybe. That that I can remember, at least. Mm -hmm. But I... I that, that's it doesn't all. really fit the question, though, because the question was that you'd want to experience it again or never. And... Sounds like you'd rather well, not do either of those. Two yeah, honestly, it sounds like maybe there's just you know there's never really been a character that you've been able to, able to relate to so much to where you it was have a it was like I, that. it was good enough where I remember it and it was a uh, positive memory saying that was an excellent piece of storytelling. I thought mm -hmm. they did a great job with it, and I'd like to see more games do or at least hit that note for me. I mm -hmm. guess. Um, so I guess yeah, I, I would experience that feeling again. I'd like to. I'm gonna Nothing's go, blown me away. I'm, I'm going to take it in sort of a different direction. I'm, I'm going to go with, like, not necessarily a, a game, but I want to go with the experiences that I, that I had that I wish that I could do again, that I could start from the beginning with. And uh, that's, right. that is competitive gaming. Because it's a different topic altogether, man. It, it sort of is, but no, this is like, it's that old, uh, it's the nostalgia, it's the, the, the feeling that you associate with it, and then becomes a different feeling now that you can't go back and do it again. But like, the first time that I went to an actual tournament, like the, the, the first time I went to a location that was fielding teams and there was a prize involved for playing games competitively, like that was... That was really cool for me, and I, I, I kind of, like, I'm getting... Every time I say this, I know that there's a thousand people going, You're not old, but I am getting, like, a little older now, right? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm above the age where I, I am considered a kid by most people. And I, I now am beginning to feel a little bit of uh, reflection on that. I'm like, wow, that was, that was kind of cool and unique, and I probably won't ever be able to do that again just because... Well, I'm older now, and my hand-eye coordination's only getting worse from this point on, so I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm you mm -hmm. know, past my prime in that area. That, Start that playing Magic be. the Gathering, man. You can have an experience yeah. uh, every Friday night. I can spend way more money, too. That's probably going to be the best part. Yeah, but one in a thousand people go infinite. I don't even know what that means. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Infinite's when you put that quartz crystal in your ass. You'll see what only happens. When you're, only when you're playing Paladins, though. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just a... You're making me level. never want to play Paladins again with this, honestly. That's probably not the intended uh, <laughs> consequence. <laughs> Nick, did you ever have an experience like yeah. this? Yeah, no, I actually took this, the question seriously. I'm sure I'm you like, did, everyone. Yeah. Hey, I no, kind of uh, did. Come on, I had a real I one. Did. All right, my answer is at the end of Castlevania Symphony of the Night when you realize that the end is only the beginning. And there's an entire second castle the size of the entire game waiting ahead of you. 
that gestalt moment of like, what the fuck? They put a whole other game at the end of the game. I've <laughs> yeah. never had anybody else do that to that extent. Never went that far. Where I was going, what the fuck? Like for ten minutes after I realized that's what happened. I that had... permanently ingrained itself in my mind as like a moment of note in gaming for me. I had a moment like that actually when I was playing Far Cry 2, but it wasn't really like yours. It was it was when I was playing Far Cry 2 and I got to the point where I realized that I had only completed 50% of the island and there was an entire other half. <laughs> and instead of being like, whoa, that's awesome, I was like, I am so done playing this forever. <laughs> and, and I never touched it again. <laughs> So there's my I'm so excited now to never play this. Yeah, I guess maybe that's closer to my actual moment of I I, I never want to experience this at all anymore <laughs> is oh this is all I wish they had ended this game right here. They just copy pasted and mirrored it over to the right <laughs> side of the island, so now I have to go. What a waste all of budget. <laughs> oh, good times. I've never like to be honest and not just deflect the question. Yeah. Probably not have I ever had a moment in games where I was so emotionally impacted that I either wanted to see it again or didn't have it in me to see it again. Not even Skate 3? <laughs> <laughs> not even Skate 3. <laughs> but that's not to say there haven't been games that have emotionally affected me on some level that is probably lower in magnitude than that. Walking Dead Season 1, you know, there was, there were some moments in there that were uh, emotional. Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons, you know, there's, there's particularly uh, towards the end of that game gets quite melancholy. I, the, the Spec Ops one, as you know, is just <laughs> the worst. <laughs> that's, that's when, in my opinion, you shoot for that level of artistry and just fucking end up jerking <laughs> yourself off. But that's... <laughs> I came out in 2012, so I don't need the. Yeah, I don't you need got to talk you got about a free pass on that now. But uh, apart from that, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if I've ever been affected on that level where it like, you know, ruined my day necessarily. But yeah, yeah. sure. I mean, I've been emotional at games. So I think like the the obvious choices for a question like this are games like To the Moon, Dear Esther, uh, you know, uh, Tear Jerkers. You know, the ones that are designed to do stuff like this to you, but. I don't know, I, I've never, like, To the Moon in particular, I had a very strong, uh, I, I had strong feelings when I played that game. I thought it was a very emotionally intense game. I thought it was well made, yeah. the narrative was great, but when I, when I finished, finished it, I wasn't like, wow, I wish I could play that for the first time again. I just thought, that was, that was very good. I'm very glad I experienced that. And then that was, that was the gist of it. But I, I've never really had an emotional impact, at least not one that comes to the top of my head that made me feel like, wow, I'm never going to be able to experience this again for the first time. That is, that's unfortunate. I mean, Soma, to some degree, even for me, like, the fact that the writing got so much better halfway through the game, like, I just didn't expect it to be as good of a game as it ended up being. Mm -hmm. So, like, it went in such a very specific place and discussed such very specific issues. Like, I love that, and I would love to have that moment again in some other context mm -hmm. uh, where somebody really takes on a topic that's that out of left field and goes into depth and then has an ending that, like, it's pretty impactful. Yeah. And it's not the usual ending that you expect it to be. So, like, I appreciate that kind of thing. Definitely. Do you feel that way about The Beginner's Guide as well? Would that be something similar? It was certainly impactful, but not as much because of the game itself, but because of how what I brought to it, like the baggage that I have as a person. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, I certainly appreciate it, but it didn't hit me as hard because of what they did. It was just that the confluence of the two. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. I like that question. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, Ryan, did you want to? Yeah, you guys want to see something cool? Yeah, of course. A apologies to the audio listeners. I just realized that with this hoodie on, I can totally make it look that I'm wearing a sumo suit. You ready? Oh, okay, absolutely. Is, I'm, I'm excited. First, you go like this. You just push it out like that, and then uh -huh. you bring it way up, and it's kind of that. that uh, yeah, you know what? You're right. Oh I yeah, it. I see what you're saying. I see it. Let me try to get normal NL, and then watch the sumo suit inflate. See the the arms coming up to your sides really sell, sells it for me because that's that's when the belly's oh, coming. Oh, well, I can out see your armpit pants. a little bit. So ah, shit! Oh yeah. no. What about that? That's better. There you go. Well, for the audio only listeners, I think we owe them this service at least. Thank you very much, <laughs> uh, Simon, for the question. If you have uh, any questions you would like to send us, they are or you send them into roundtableyt at gmail.com. Roundtableyt 
at gmail.com for your Ask Roundtable questions. It's time for everybody's favorite segment after their favorite segment. It's Nick's Weird Games. And uh, how about in the theme of E3 musical guests? We could go for, you know, well, we've already mentioned a few. We got Ja Rule up there. How about that? Yellow card. Yeah, that yeah, would be definitely. Stank, that's yeah. a good one. Mm-hmm. So you're going to say, like, in the key of E. I want to hear. <laughs> in the key of E. <laughs> Pacha Bell's real catch. specific with this now. E. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to give you free reign, really, because I, th- I think you can probably pull something out of your hat there. But, uh, Nick, feel free All to right. grab your game. Every week, if you're unfamiliar with this, Nick goes and grabs a weird game from his very extensive catalog of weird games, and Ryan provides us the theme song, usually. So without further ado, this is uh, in the tune of Hoobastank's Stank's 2004 hit, The Reason. Mm. That'd be it. It's only a Nick's weird game. It came out for Sega in 2002. And now you're gonna hear just what it's called. I just want a weird game. He's found another weird game. <laughs> that isn't the, quite the same. A weird game to stump all of you. For the PlayStation 2. <laughs> Something like that. Right. Came, came together, a, the end. Yeah, came together right. a little bit Nicely. more mm. towards the Good end. Good job. Almost fell apart there. Solid. All right. Here we go again. Another Nick's weird game. Uh, right. And this one has a little bonus Easter egg at the end that I'm going to enjoy uh, explaining later, to you guys. This is actually <laughs> hilarious. Um, actually, it might come out earlier than the end. Okay, so we got a PSU game. Nothing surprising about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're talking about a December 4th, 2003 North American release. And we're talking about a turn-based strategy video game that's card-based. Does anyone want to take a guess immediately? Yu-Gi-Oh! One of those, one no. of those uh, devil, demon devil dice no, survivors. Not, Shin Megami not one of those. Shin Megami Tensei 4. By the man himself, Shin Megami Tensei. Exactly. <laughs> Believe it or not, is not by that developer or publisher. Card-based turn-based strategy game. Jersey Devil. I don't think I have no. Glover. Keep it up. All right. Uh, so we've got a situation where you play as someone who takes on the role of a scepter. Scepters are beings that have the ability to use magical cards to summon creatures, cast spells, and perform various other feats of wizardry. As uh, players advance through the game, they earn additional cards. They use to create customized books, which are decks of 50 cards, which are better suited to defeat their foes. Uh, so that's kind of like the general outline of it. Uh, classified as board game, collectible card game, single player, and multiplayer. There's a story and a versus mode. Uh, it also came out on a lot of other systems, even the Sega Saturn and PlayStation 1, followed by the Nintendo DS and PSP or PS3 in, in Japan. Actually, a lot of those were Japanese-only releases. I am drawing a total blank on yeah, this one. Yeah, I, I don't got nothing. know. I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> Not I'm even taking close. a shot in the dark. Is that my yep. fucking microphone auto-adjusts? Osmopandarion. No. Uh, like, the developer we're, we're is the shot. Omiya Soft, and the publisher is NEC with the website NEC Games. Oh, is that still around? Okay, we got we got to validate Games. this claim here. It that's, should be that's the Easter egg it's called it's Mama Mia. Oh, it's Mia. Net Games. Oh, it's that's Net good. Games. That's fun. It should be called Mama Mia Software because it's like Games Mama that Mia. Here we go again. Serious ah. punch. Net Games. But that wasn't your your. Call to go look it up. Oh, I <laughs> still gotta guess it. I just need to know Net Games. Is it uh, the Net Games classic JB Herald Murder Club? No, I've never heard of that actually. Would it have to be uh, crate, crate Maze? Bonk crate Three maze. Bonk's Big Adventure, maybe. <laughs> I was, that was my next one. <laughs> What about Chu Man Fu? That seems like a sensitive one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sounds like you don't know. No, I Whoa, don't think I do. dude. These guys yeah. made CyberCore for the Sega Master System. That's nothing. They made JJ and Jeff in 1987 for Hudson Soft. Got more content than Civ with the Brave New World expansion. JB Harold Murder Club? <laughs> man, as we already talked about JB Harold Murder Club. Sorry, that's, old, that's old hat, man. Sorry. Is it JJ and Jeff? Not JJ and Jeff. Is it Angelique Special? Dude, I gotta play fucking Time Ball. I wanna play China Warrior. <laughs> <laughs> is it 
The Legendary Axe 2? No. I, I, I TV I, Sports Basketball? You're reading from a list, which means you don't know the answer. <laughs> I find I that very we know this one, Nick. I'm sorry to say uh, you did not win this game. Uh, today's game is called Cul-de-Sept or Cold-Sept. I'm not sure how you're supposed to say that. Man, I have no idea what that is. That is like, I think, the most foreign Nick's Weird game we've ever had. <laughs> I have never seen that Some before. pictures for you. Is that even on we the internet? We did have a winner, though. Uh, yeah, it's on the internet. Uh, we had a winner here in chat. I see... It had a sequel. MS20422, definitely guessed right there. I see someone with Cultsept Saga, which is uh, another game, actually. Oh, and before that person, even the Great King Dan got it. Cultsept and Cultsept 2, jeez. But they had a Cultsept game come out on the PSP as recently as 2008 in Japan. Wow. My goodness. Look at that. The more we know. Fairly popular game, I guess, in some circles. Yeah. Uh, just not this one. Right. <laughs> okay. Nick's weird games. God damn. He stumped us. All right. What, uh, do you have the tally sheet running still? Conveniently located, I, perhaps? Not in front of me, but I could look it up again. You All were right. doing pretty good last time. Were we? You were right. doing better than you thought you were, is what I mean. While you're doing that, I'll go ahead and say uh, thank you very much for watching this episode of Roundtable Live. I hope you all enjoyed it. I'm going to go ahead and thank our patrons for this episode as well. We continue to get... All those uh, one and four and two and five dollar patrons showing up in my email, and I'm just so happy about that. So again, thank you guys so much for the uh, the smaller contributions. Those are adding up in a big way. So thank you very much for supporting the show. I uh, do want to give a special shout out to those patrons that have been supporting at the twenty dollar tier and above, which include but are not limited to Julian Abelsgard, Scrody one one nine, Greenlight, Mavier, Orin Saltzman, Christopher Flag. Uh, General Crunk, Alexander Spillman, Jonathan Graham, Matt Brizzlebrip, Myth Scarab, Eric Scooley, Mediocrities, Super Monoman, Smurfette, Logan Ray, Justin Positron, Ignacio0891, and I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. There we go. Uh, thank you guys very much for continuing to support the show on Patreon. Also, feel free to go rate the show five stars on iTunes. Subscribe to the subreddit, which is roundtablepodcast.reddit.com. Uh, follow us over on Twitter, at roundtablepc. And uh, follow us here on the Twitch channel as well, twitch.tv slash roundtablepodcast, to catch us live. Normally, we're live every Friday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, today, we're sort of doing a weird thing, sort of a makeup cast uh, slash pre-makeup podcast for uh, this coming Friday, where Mathis and Nick will, of course, be at PAX East. Uh, we're going to figure out what we're going to do as far as that's concerned. Most likely not going to be on show on Friday, but we'll uh, see if we can't maybe get another one together uh, shortly after that. For now... Thank you guys very much for watching this episode of Roundtable Live, and we'll see you next time. Bye. See y'all. Goodbye. Hey guys. <laughs>